So welcome, welcome, welcome to episode two, oh, episode 19, series two of the Plastic Crack podcast. I always get that wrong. I always get that wrong. So welcome, welcome, welcome to your Monday night of fun and games and stupidity uh, with Ken from Miniature War Games Warriors over there on the, hello, over there in that, that direction. Below me, we've got Martin from Seventh Sun. Hello. And Steve, all things German, who hasn't done a German all year from On Point HQ. And this week, uh, we are, we have a we have royalty. We have well importance <laughs> anyway. Uh, we have somebody who knows what they're talking about. I think, uh, which is which is unheard of. We have um, Doctor Harry Sidebottom, um, esteemed author, historian, and war gamer, uh, who's joined us tonight. Welcome, Harry. Thank you so much Hi. for joining us. Well, thank you very much for asking me on. You are very welcome. Hope you can bring a bit of decorum and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> compete with Martin on the history side because he well, always seems to tell us everything. Well, 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 before the decorum, but I think there's something that we need to we need to announce, isn't there, Dom? Today's a very special day, <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it? Because I, is look, it Waterloo? Look, I, I, is it? No, I've been out specially for you. Look, I actually <laughs> went to the shop <laughs> straight <laughs> after my vaccine. I went straight to the shop. So happy birthday! Thank you. Your twenty first birthday. Twenty first again. This is really yeah. this is really hard to wear with head headphones. <laughs> <laughs> but the great thing was, was I, I got home. I got home, and my daughter immediately thought she was having a party. Oh. <laughs> I'll pop it there. I'll pop it there. But yes, happy birthday to, to well, Dom. You did rather better than Steve did, who sent me this. <laughs> <laughs> a French badger. For some reason, he thought that was hilarious. I don't know well, why. I <laughs> I no idea why that is hilarious, but it is apparently so. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. You're yes, welcome. It, You're it welcome. Is my twenty-first, my twenty-first, and then some birthday today. So, um, I, see what I do on my birthday? Come and talk to you lot. It's ridiculous, ridiculous. Anyway, uh, we have got lots of people in the chat. I'm not going to go through every single person. Apologies. There's lots of people sitting here as, as usual. But welcome everyone. Good, David Barker, Louis, Corey, Ham and Jam, Shring Seven, Tim. Uh, Clodden, as he just popped in to say, he's not going to be around, so oh, Clodden's not in the chat. Evil Jim, he's here. Ricky, Gary, Enemy at Sight, Luke, uh, SJMT66. God, it's hard to say that. Joseph, Steve, Friends of General Haig, Lazy Pirate Painting. I haven't seen that name before. Welcome, welcome. GP, Drew, uh, Marky. Alid, I've said I wasn't going to say everybody. I think I've pretty much said it's everyone now, haven't we? Peter's here, Philip's here. Anyway, goodly crew, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the Monday, Monday Night Plastic Crack podcast. So what have we all been up to? Ken, have you actually done anything this week, mate? Have, have you I actually have. done any I painting? I have, I have, I have. I'm going to get it up. Ooh. Yeah, right at the got, bottom, I can see it. So I got, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, can't <laughs> lose it. Right, so I got to play a game this week. Yay! Yay! Yeah, I had Liam around and we uh, played uh, some Victory at Sea, and it's awesome. It's everything I wanted it to be. So I'm very happy. He was even more happy to. He's nearly bought, nearly bought himself a Japanese fleet just from playing it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, no, it plays really well, actually. I need a bit of a bigger table, but obviously in my current house, I haven't got room for a big table. But we just played it, chucked it on the table there and just had a good game and it was good fun. So very nice. much. But it's all you want, really, isn't it? That's, yeah, exactly. That's what you want. But painting, I actually managed to paint some actual things. So I painted these Japanese. Oh, oh. Yeah. So this is my Japanese uh, from the Victory at Sea start set. These were done in one day. Um, I painted all these in one day, so it didn't take long at all. It took me about two and a half hours, and yeah, they got their first run out the other the other night. So yeah, very. How did you do? How did you do? Or is it is it going to be in a video? Is it top no, scene? no, 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 no video. It was um, the Japanese are very very good. I played the I played the Royal Navy. Um, I so had an air. Yeah, no, not necessarily. It was, it, 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 <laughs> yes. <coming> out, it, <laughs> it was. It was. It was. It was one of those things. I was on call, so we couldn't finish it completely. But it was. It was uh, working out. Uh, I was getting casualties at first, but then I was managing to do strike backs with aircraft, um, torpedo, torpedo uh, bombers, little swordfish are devastating. Believe it or not, okay. um, and uh, yeah, they're good fun. But the Japanese, their torpedoes are 
deadly on their uh, on their cruisers. The range they've got on them is unreal. Uh, but yeah, no, really good. And I saw a really cool thing the other day. Is I saw a video of um, someone's painted up some uh, the US fleet, and they've literally used like free paints. So I've used well, I'm going to be using like Space Wolf Gray uh, from the Contrast Range. Uh, what that Tesla te te Talisar Blue. And, oh, yeah. a, and like a, a white for a dry brush, and that's all I'm going to use. <laughs> that's oh, so, Ken, do you, do you, yeah. is it? I've put off buying that starter about forty-seven times. <laughs> <laughs> it's been in, it's been in my basket on Amazon three times so far, and I've, I've just gone, <laughs> oh, no, no, I don't. I, is it worth getting? Is it honestly worth getting? Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah, yeah. You can play, you can play solo as well, which is even, mm. you know, which is which is really cool. Um, and it doesn't take long to paint them, honestly. The, the, the US are going to probably take me an hour to paint. So, because I've got that, you just buy those two paints, Dean, and done. So, yeah, right. I, they I, are I, simple I, to paint, aren't they? That's the one good thing about them. I might have to, I might have to indulge. I think you've sold it to me. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. if anybody's running the, 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 the book on what Steve's secret project is. That isn't it. Right? It's not. Strike that one off straight away. Strike that one off straight away. What have you been up to then, Steve, this week? You, um, you can probably guess. <sighs> it no, wouldn't be some snowy things, would it? It would be. It's more yeah. US Airborne. So, uh, first of all, I did... Ta-da! There we go. Oh, very nice. So, I kit-bashed me. So, it's a HQ unit on the, on the left. Um, a bazooka team and a medic team mm -hmm. um i actually built a, a radio for the um the second guy in the hq team um and then here they are in sort of an action shot yay over there nco pointing and shouting sven hassel style gotta be done <laughs> um <laughs> and then on thursday i went a bit mad um because i started off making a forward observation team and ended up making this um it just I, I spent 45 minutes building the radio pack uh, <laughs> steve you're insane you are insane. i love that you, but you're probably gonna hate me for this but do you know what my favorite bit about that base is i like the post not i like the post i like the post i really like the post i like, I like that it's not straight as well which is even cooler i like that um so yeah, forty-five minutes. It it actually took me longer to build that than it did to paint it. I painted it during uh, a couple of breaks and my my lunch uh, in work the next day. Finished definitely it off. Definitely breaks. They were definitely breaks. Oh, they definitely no, they, they definitely weren't breaks. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, it was completed. Um, but yeah, the uh, the forty-five minute radio that was something else. That was. I mean, I, I sent you the picture how small it was on my finger. It's made up of about seven different pieces. You could make a real radio in 45 minutes, couldn't you? Let alone a little tiny model one for crying out. I know. Um, but I don't know. I, I, somebody, somebody, all, um, with my Germans, I always used to make um, radio operators because I just think it, it's just such an iconic thing for World War II to have a radio operator. Yeah. Um, and somebody said, why do you build so many radios? And I'm like, because I like building them. I think do I probably... You, I, um... Sorry, uh, I was going to say because I know you you purchased um, Operation Ooh. Squad. A radio operators in that game have you the more you you daisy chain through radios to to call in mortar strikes. So if one person can see it, they can shout to a radio operator near them that can then communicate with another radio oh, operator, right. and it goes all the way back to the mortar. I tell so you what. More, so yeah, you've got if you've got <laughs> all those radio teams, you're going to be fine. I am so glad I bought those rules. I had a quick read through um, on was it Thursday, Thursday night, Friday? Uh, yeah, but I'm very, very impressed. I, I, lo I love the um, the count, the, the reacting, reacting, counteract rule. I just think that makes it. it it's going to be so entertaining playing that. Um, yeah, really, really looking forward to it. So yes, cool. oh, should, well. should be a lot of fun. Nice. My my favorite statement out of all that is when I you like when I used to paint Germans. It felt like you wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to no because what I was thinking of doing actually I've got a because I've been kicked back. I was actually did a land snack, not, not airborne. Um, I've got a load of the winter Germans left over, so I think I'm going to do some um, Bastogne Germans as well as a counter force for my uh, my airborne. 
I can paint Germans again. I think um, didn't. Definitely. No, it would. I'm, I'm, I'm going cold turkey at the moment, so yeah. <laughs> so I think we were going to have to get the sign writer to change your your sign because it's been World War II German for ages, and you haven't know. the bloody one. That's ridiculous. No. Uh, but yeah, tonight, tonight is Landschnecht again. Night. Okay, good, good, good. I'm going to have to issue two yellow cards straight away already at this point. <laughs> I was going to say, James, you get one for that. <laughs> uh, who do we need to badger about birthdays? That is a definite yellow card, my friend. Uh, Luke, you, this, this is actually, I, I'm almost going to rescind this yellow card because it's quite funny. Instead of victory at seas, can we have orcas and otters? The name is special, <laughs> we all need. That's actually quite funny. So maybe we won't uh, give you a yellow on that. On VAR, we'll, we'll take that one away. Uh, but there you go. What about you, Martin? What have you been up to, mate? Uh, I managed to have a game, um, but because I had a game, because I, I was spending most most of my weeks sorting out how we were going to play it, I didn't paint very much. So I painted something a bit different <laughs> um, because um. I just well, I, I I'd done them before, um, and I thought I had a few more off the front of the magazine. So I painted up some Warhammer models, um, which I painted up as living statues um, in a really really basic. Well, I think it's basic scheme, um, but I had a lot of fun doing it. So I'd done, so I painted those three before, but I basically just rebased them. And then I did these. These took about 20 minutes to do, like each, not including the basin. Um, so I did them. That was a lot of, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then they came with this thing, which for some reason I'm really, oh, it's gone away. I'm really, I really enjoyed painting. <laughs> I really enjoyed painting. Um, <laughs> Um, so I had a lot of fun painting those. I've got to be honest. Um, I might even get some more just to paint, just because they were really, really fun to paint. Um, I have no idea how to play it um, because it's been so long. Um, I, I have a horrible feeling I'm going to start looking into things now, and I'm going to end up spending a lot of money. But um, I had a lot. I, I, it was just a bit different. I've done, as you'll see, so because I've done so many historicals, I just wanted to do something a bit different. Um, yeah. And for the histor historicals, obviously, we were, we were getting ready to, to play a game. So I got all of the Wars of the Roses stuff out. So I've painted about 500 now, and I got them out on the uh, the table. Uh, so that was that's half of it, because I couldn't get a full long shot. So that's everything I've painted in the last sort of nine months um, for the Wars of the Roses. Um, and then I actually managed to get my ga our, our game in, and it, there is a battle report. It's going to be a bit of a weird one, but... Um, I thought I'd just share a couple of photos. So that was the that was that was the middle of the battlefield because I can't the camera's lens isn't wide enough to get in <laughs> the, the other end. So that's um, and so we we didn't use everything. But I used I've got about 30, 35 units done. I took twenty for the game, um, but I had to take the big bombard in the middle um, against my opponent's Lancastrians, who's painted up about the same amount as me. Um, but it was awfully good fun. And then this is a picture from the grand melee in the middle that started happening, um, which was just a, a big smash in the middle between the Lancastrians and the Yorkists, obviously. Um, but it, it was good fun. But it is going to be, the battle report will be, will be going up, but it's, it's I don't know what people are going to think because it, it basically, something happens in the battle and then effectively we have to end the battle. So um, it stops, but we are going to be going into a campaign system. Um, and I'm just going to share this just because even though I suppose technically it'll come later, but I'll say that I'd share it because he's not, he doesn't, he's not on Facebook or anything like that. That is my opponent's command base for his Lancastrians. Oh, very that's, nice. um, that's the third Duke. And, um, you, I don't know if people can see it, but if you look at that, so he's, he's they're running down the Yorkists. Um, but the guy on the black horse on the, um, on the right hand side, he's actually been speared by a Lance and he's managed to get it. So the Lance is splintering as it, as it, as it hits him. Uh, with copious amounts of super glue uh, to try <laughs> go, to go all together, but it's um it, that's ba that's bigger than all the command bases I make. That's like on a, I think it's bigger than a CD. It's um it must be about 120 mil across. Uh, but yeah, so that was my that was my week in, in war gaming. There you go. Fantastic. <laughs> I do like the uh, did like the two riders on that particularly. Fantastic. Oh my goodness! Uh, what have I been up to? I, I've done a. I had a game this week as well, actually, which was really nice. First time in ages. Uh, I've even got a picture of it. Yeah, that one there. That'll do. Played a bit of Shakos and Bennets. Um, we've got the Russians out. Uh, the winter scene doesn't really work with the uh, with Ken's <laughs> mat, but whatever. Um, it was a good game, actually. Good fun. We just Jonathan came round and we had a game and um, first time to try out the new Shakos and and. Uh, 
Bennett's, and it was it was fun. It was good fun. It was a bloodbath. So I will do a video on that at some point when I can edit it down a bit because it's enormous. Um, but uh, it was fun. Really, just nice to get to be able to look your opponent in the eyes for the first time in a long, a long time. Uh, so just to celebrate, I did a few more Russians. So uh, <laughs> I, I started doing some my Black Powder Russian army. Um, so that's the first uh, eight. No. I don't know how many of that is, 4, 8, 12, 16, 16. First 16 of uh, Grenadier Battalion I'm going to do. Uh, the other 16 are almost Very nice. done. And they were fun to do, actually. Quite enjoyed. They're obviously Warlord ones, um, obviously. They are Warlord ones, I say, obviously. Uh, I just did a video on this. That this was my elves that I'm struggling with. I'm really struggling with. And everyone's made some very good suggestions about how I need to get inspiration for painting elves because it's... I found it so difficult to do without a guideline. When you're doing historical, which is what I normally do, you've got the guidelines there, but you do fantasy. It's like, I don't know what they should be. What should an elf look like? Um, <laughs> so, uh, but that was fun. Um, so I've got to get on with that. That's my stupidity of agreeing to do the, uh, joining in with the Saga Age of Magic eight point challenge. I don't know why I agreed. Well, I do. I wanted to get through these figures because they've been sitting there for a couple of years now. I need to get painted. Uh, and I did some Dead Man's Hands. So there's some more gang members there. These are the baddies. Uh, I think that's, the, was it called Scarred Man, the one in the middle? Yeah, that's uh, that's not Jonah Hex. Um, mm. <laughs> this, that's not Jonah Hex. Not Jonah and Hex. And not Jonah Hex. Totally not yeah. a rip-off of Jonah Just Hex. not well. Jonah Hex. No, no, that is not. Uh, I think a couple of them are actually artisan figures, some of the other ones there. I can't remember where I got them. But they, they were good fun. They're always good fun to paint up. And I did a couple of good guys. So that's not Jeff Bridges in the middle. Um, <laughs> oh, so. how come? Oh, so you got to write you that one's not a 40 mil scale one. No, that isn't the 40 mil scale. Thank you for pointing that one out, Martin. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, that is not a 40 mil scale. That is true 28. Well, 30 probably if you count these figures. They're so bloody big, aren't they? But yeah, it was good fun to do. I do like doing the old uh, Dead Man's Hand. They're good fun. Really good fun to do. So that's what I was up to. So I hope everyone else is getting some games in. I can see a few more people joined us. We've got uh, King Matt has joined us. Uh, Travis is here. Hi, Travis. Peter. Hello, mate. Hello, mate. Uh, Leslie. Da, da, da. A few more besides. So Harry. Harry, Harry, oh. Harry. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're <laughs> nearly, nearly 20 minutes in, and I we haven't really had a chance to talk to you properly yet. So now everyone's assembled. We've got a decent crew. Um, so... Tell me a little bit about your background, because you're obviously by profession a historian, but you're clearly also an author and a gamer. So what sort of came first, if you like? Did you start out as a gamer and then turn it, you know, which way round did it happen? That's a good question. Um, well, with wargaming, I think because I'm a middle-aged bloke, it's a fairly standard trajectory. Airfix generation, <laughs> yeah. grew up making Spitfires, Messerschmitts. Um, got into wargaming with Wargames Research Group Ancients. Oh, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, must have been about fourth edition when I started. Um, I was very much into it, but then I, then I stopped. I stopped when I went to uni. Um, yeah. I think a lot of us do. Yeah, I was thinking about it earlier. I thought, well, because you, you were bound to ask that, Tom. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, well, there, there were probably two reasons why I stopped. Or like a like an alcoholic, you don't ever stop being a war gamer. You're just a recovering war gamer. Who's not doing <laughs> Very true. Very true. Um, and I think, well, this must have been the early late seventies, early eighties, and mm -hmm. war game rules at that point were, to my mind, getting more and more complex. And kind of losing focus in that you never quite knew what role you were playing on the battlefield, whether you're being the general, but at the same time, you're meant to be counting every damn arrow that was shot. So you're also being at a lower level, NCO level. And I just kind of, it went a bit stale. And also, of course, it was going to college. And the fact that as I was studying classics, I thought if I was ever going to get a girlfriend, the possibility <laughs> of doing it. So what do you no do? Well, mainly, you <laughs> mainly I read Latin and Greek text. And when I'm not doing that, I play with toy soldiers. So mm. I kind of moved it to one side mm. and concentrated more on, on the drinking and the rugby, really. But I always retained an interest in wargaming. I, I 
I've always been a member of the Society of Ancients since I was a kid, um, which is a great society. Um, and I got back into it when my eldest boy, eldest son was about eight. Mm -hmm. And by chance, I saw an advert for the show that happened in the shopping centre in Milton Keynes. Was it called Campaign? Is it called yeah. Campaign? Yeah. I think you're yeah. right. Yeah, I think so. Really, it's quite an interesting setup because yeah. it's, it's in a concourse in in the big shopping thing outside John Lewis or something. And um, <laughs> I took him along and we played a very big version of Memoir 44 and a massively expanded version of Wings of War. And he loved it, loved both of them. And that, of course, gave me the excuse to go out, get back into it buy shed loads of toys and tell my wife their educational tools for my son. They were just for your son. It was part of your yeah. bonding experience with your son. I, I get that. Yeah. It, it, was, it was a fathering parenting experience, not just me yeah. playing with toys anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems entirely reasonable to me. <laughs> Biggest disappointment having two daughters. They didn't want to play toy soldiers. It so, was so upsetting. I didn't have that excuse. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So you, it, it's ancient primarily that interest you in terms of wargaming is it or what sort of periods do you play um actually no oddly enough um obviously because i'm an ancient historian i am very into ancients and um mm. play a lot of um command and colors ancients a lot of simon miller's excellent to the strongest uh -huh. um yeah. what's the other ones aurelian by sam Mustafa. i'm very keen on too but no, i'm really eclectic in wargaming i'm a historical gamer not a fantasy gamer or sci-fi gamer Although, yeah, I have nothing against sci-fi or fantasy. It's just it, you know, I'm more interested in the history. Mm. So playing all sorts of things. The last, okay, the last game I played kind of proves the point, your point, that I'm only into ancients. I played a couple of weeks ago Tribal, a skirmish set by some guys in New Zealand. It's designed primarily for Maori tribal warfare, but they also have a bit at the back for... Aztecs and Iroquois and all sorts of others. But I used it for Homeric Warfare, for the Iliad, for the Siege of Troy. Pure, purely on the ground, well, on the grounds I like the look of the rules and I read a re review of them on in one of the glossy war game mags. But also, because some years ago, I'm a compulsive buyer of things that bring and buy stalls at shows. <laughs> and about 10 years ago... Oh, yeah. that one. Hello, that one. you've got a friend in me, <laughs> That's sir. Ken over there, that's him. <laughs> come back? I came back having spent a fortune on a huge Mycenaean 28 mil ready painted army, which I'd never used in about 10 or 15 years, probably. So I got them on the table. But no, in terms of wargaming, I, um, what have I also played recently? Long Street by Sam Mustafa. Um, I tend to, because the table in my office is quite small, the only games I can leave set up tend to now be board war games or skirmish games if i want to play a big battle i've got to use the dining room table and as my wife runs a bnb from the front of our farmhouse yes you know, some guests might object to you know having waterloo reenacted next to their marmalade <laughs> I, I don't i have to rely on mates who are better equipped with war gaming tables than me which luckily in east Anglia, i've um yeah got quite a few because one of the nice things about getting back into war gaming is just making new friends. Yeah, I've made yeah, a yeah, shed load yeah. of new friends from all, all, well, all over East Anglia because that's where I live, but all sorts of different people. And then you start discovering people who are already friends are are secret war gamers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, almost with a masonic handshake, they then make, oh, <laughs> actually, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's very true. It's very true indeed. It is funny, funny that. And I think, if anything, I mean, one of the—I mean, we tell the story that the four of us had never met before we did this. In fact, Martin, me, and Steve have never actually met face face to face, and Ken has never met Steve, um, Steve face to face. But otherwise, and Steve's never met any of us face to face. I've never met anyone. He, just, <laughs> he never meets anybody at all. He just stays locked in his little room and paints out huge, ridiculous figures. So it's weird that these sort of things come together, but it almost feels like through the lockdowns and everything else, it's almost got a wider circle of friends than gaming mm. friends than ever before. I mean, through this, through the channels and what have you, I talk to so many more people that I, that I would consider friends now that I, it's extraordinary. It really is. So. so have you managed to keep gaming through the shutdowns or have you 
just literally packed up and have you tried zooming and that kind of thing? Um, I managed to get two games in between lockdowns with friends, but um, I, I mainly solo war game anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, because for me, it's almost a relief from work because mm-hmm. the game's in my office. So if I'm writing something or researching something and it's going very badly, rather than what I used to do, which is chain smoke and drink endless cups of tea outside, I can actually go to the table, play a few moves in the game, try and clear my head and then go back and sometimes miraculously the next paragraph works, you know. So... Wargaming is health benefits. I love it. (laughs) 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 Who'd have thought it? And I also also force... um, mainly my oldest son, but sometimes my younger son to play games with me, which kind of, it works quite well because I tend to be quite a simple gamer. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you're pressed for time and you've got a lot of other stuff to think about. And I do tend to go for the more simple war game rules. I just don't really have the time to learn and master a very complex, a hundred page set is just, no, sorry, I, you know, I'll never get round to reading it. If someone else face to face teaches me how to play, that's different. And um, sometimes it happens. So no, I'm very, um, very into the. Um, I don't know if any of you guys belong to it. War Games Developments, the the group that produced the little um, fanzine thing, the Nugget. I, I find them very, very good because they actually have. Also, I mean, their sort of mission statement is a group of like-minded war gamers, but they have very often published in their magazine um, very simple, but simple mechanics, but deep on history games that I, even I can learn. And probably after I've played them six times, I might stop making mistakes in them too. I tell you, we, all, we, we can play games for years. I, I played so my first game of the new Shakos and Tomahawk, uh, Shakos and Bayonets rules. Um, and I, bear in mind, they're exactly the same, basically, to, as the Muskets and Tomahawks version, which I've been playing for as long as they came out. And yet I was reading the rules again before the game, and I found a rule that I didn't even, I'd never even seen before. It was like, oh, how did I miss that? And nobody I played against has ever used the rules. And it's like, what the hell? I must have played, I don't know how many, hundred, loads and loads of games of it, but yeah. Uh, Joshua says, the Masonic handshake turns out at my work. It's surprisingly Wargamer heavy. The fight the fight club <laughs> nod as you pass in the car park or in the office. <laughs> that, that, is, that, that is definitely a thing. You do that. See you down the club next week, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Peter says, it was called Campaign. Uh, the Milton Keynes show, I think. Right. Doesn't happen anymore. That's what he says. Um, who else have we got? Uh, oh, no, everyone's talking about playing games in French. I don't know why that why you'd want to do that. So tell me, Harry. I mean, given the fact that you you're into, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, I won't explain that one. Uh, you're given that you're you're obviously you know a proper historian. Um, you teach it. Do you research it? You do all that sort of thing. Do you find Historical games, particularly since you play them, are frustrating if they're not historically accurate enough, or is it just purely an escapism game fun? You know, if something really untoward that you know just wouldn't ever have happened, does that bother you? Yes, massively. I come over <laughs> unbelievably, it ruins the game for me. Um, last year I got Board War Game, um, Time of Crisis, uh, the GMT thing about the third century AD Roman Empire, yeah. which mm-hmm. I actually write, almost all my novels are set in. Yeah. And it's a beautiful game. You unpack it and all the components are lovely. And it's actually quite a good game. Mm. The only problem is it bears no relationship to history whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> After one play, I worked out, well, the way to win is to be the pretender who starts in Spain or somewhere like Greece that's miles from the frontiers, and you'll probably mm-hmm. win. And, and in the whole of the 3rd century AD, there are about 60 different emperors. And guess what? Not one of them came from Greece. Or came from that part. <laughs> <laughs> they all came from the armies on the Danube. If you start there, basically, you're going to lose. And, yeah, it, it did really spoil the game for me. And it was a shame, because 
so there was so much historical chrome in the game in the cards and, and the illustrations and it was a good game but yeah it was very very frustrating yeah i get it's a bit like reading other people's historical novels when I, I get horribly pedantic and want to get a red bar out and mark them and go, no, 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 that could never have happened in ancient Rome. <laughs> uh, occasionally, occasionally I do, and I, I send emails to mates who write them, and that obviously pleases Ben Kane and the others enormously. <laughs> I bet they're really pleased to receive that. Sort yeah. of thing, Gary. <laughs> no, I'm sure, they love that. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask <laughs> Why do you, I get a load of them? You do get the, the bizarre sort of feedback by the internet. And they oh. always start with the words, I think you'll find. Oh. Mm. Oh, oh, we, yeah, we, we get I get that quite so is there oh. is there like a, is there like a secret WhatsApp group of all the historical authors? Do you all do you all communicate with each other? <laughs> oh, I'd love that to be the case. Oh no, I don't, I was just, just curious. <laughs> Actually we do, because um it's a weird thing because you're kind of there's a feeling of all being colleagues because mm. you want to promote historical fiction. Um, but at the same time, you do know your rivals. It's weird. But no, I'm, I'm very, very good mates with Ben Kane, Tony Richards, all sorts of people. We tend to try and, well, in a non-COVID year, we try and meet up um, usually in London because it's the most convenient place to get to from the rest of the country and uh, eat steak and chips and drink a lot of lager. And moan furiously about our publishers. <laughs> <laughs> that seems entirely reasonable. Well, it's like it just sounds like any other gamer getting together, just moaning about whoever, whatever their last game and how badly they rolled the dice and how their opponent didn't have half their figures painted, and when they did, they had the wrong color, you know, headbands on or something ridiculous. So yeah. Uh, Louis says, I have a feeling Harry is a, is a like minded and absolutely hates historical revision. And I can't even say that re revisionism is <laughs> probably true. And then I hate, says, hate historical it's... revisionism unless I'm doing it. Yeah. <laughs> in which case, it's a staggering new insight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So, maybe on to the, 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 the book side of things. So, obviously, you know, you've, you've what, how many books have you done now? Is it eight? Uh, oh, do, 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 do. six with Peng, um, seven in the Warrior of Rome series, yeah, Throne of the Seas of Trilogy, where we've got to 10, two standalone ones, 12 novels, oh, 12, two history right. Wow, oh, so, right, and so you, you do write serious history as well as, I mean, in terms of public publishing, I don't mean papers, which clearly you write a lot of, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I do. It's funny to say because when I first got a deal um, for the historical novels, um, a couple of my colleagues at Oxford instantly assumed I'd be writing children's fiction, which I, I, really puzzles me. Well, mm. perhaps it, it's almost, I thought, of an unspoken thing. It's only intellectually respectable to write historical fiction if it's for children and it has a very clear educational purpose. Mm. Um, and I do quite often get asked at literary festivals well, in the days when they used to actually happen, and you actually ever saw anyone. Um, the question that always got me was, when did you give up being a proper historian and start <laughs> writing fiction? <laughs> hey, thanks. Um, in fact, the fiction came before the history, because um, what I'm discovering with my two sons that uh, the weirdness about our national curriculum is that kids are encouraged to write, write creative fiction until they're about 13, they write stories. Yeah. And then suddenly they stop, and instead they're analysing Steinbeck's, Steinbeck's Mice and Men or something. I was the weird kid who never stopped. So I carried on writing fiction. I, One of the key reasons I wanted to become an academic was the misapprehension that they didn't have to do much work. And <laughs> I, I thought I'd get half the year off. And I also mistakenly thought I could write a novel in half a year. <laughs> and, and both these things turned out horribly untrue. <laughs> I certainly agree with your point, though, about um, education. When when I was in sort of primary school, I had a, a teacher, and she always encouraged creative writing, uh, any any sort of creativity. And as soon as I got to like comprehensive school, it seemed to be sort of beaten out of you. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. The, it wasn't the done thing. You weren't really encouraged or, or invited to to even you know express yourself like that. It's kind of disheartening, really. Um, yeah. But no, absolutely, absolutely agree with that. 
So yeah, I, Dom, I still do write history and um, proper, serious, straightforward history. Uh, I don't uh, think um, there really is the complete divide between writing conventional history and writing historical fiction that a lot of people think right. there is. Uh -huh. so think about it, in many ways, you the process is very similar. You decide what you're going to research, what you're going to read, where you're going to go, what you're going to look at. You take notes on it. You arrange the notes in a certain order. You come up with a, a structure and a plan of what's going in the book. And then you leave 90% of the research out, unfortunately. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> well, if you're any good, you do. Um, and I, I don't think they, they are massively different things. Obviously, I don't make up dialogue in my historical, straight no. historical conventional stuff. Uh, or describe, actually, no, I do describe the sunset in the book I'm writing now. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Keep that one close, yeah. yeah. So, do you? I mean, do you start with an idea when you're writing a, his, a historical fiction novel? I mean, does it come when you're doing your other research and your normal sort of day job? You think, oh, that would make a perfect character for a for a book, or to build a story around? Is that how it comes together, or is it, you know, as you're doing the re I'm going to do this period because you, you've done basically most of your works have been around Rome. Um, and so do you just sort of then dig into more around Rome and think that's an interesting campaign or a different ca a different theory that I could build a story around? I mean, what's the process that starts, I guess? Um, without sounding too much like some terribly pretentious French auteur, usually, you don't <laughs> know. Um, usually loads of different things have to come together before you get the idea for a book. Yep. Once in a blue moon, it is that, you know, eureka moment and you think, just as you say, that would make a great basis for a story. Um, the one, in fact, my last novel, The Return, um, which comes out in paperback on Thursday, if anyone wants to buy it. Good job, good job, well done. <laughs> There's way I work that in. Um, years ago for teaching, I had to read Cicero's treatise on oratory called The Brutus. And in it was a little anecdote about a murder in Calabria, in the forest of Sela. And I just, it would open my eyes to the fact that out in the countryside, Roman, the Pax Romana didn't work, that it was lawless. Yeah. That the, the south of Italy at that point was like the Wild West. And I thought that would make a great location for a novel, a great setting for a novel, a murder mystery there. Yeah. And I then thought about this for about 20 years. Till I don't read these things, do you? Come on. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're better if you leave them for a bit. Um, but then I was listening to an audio book of short stories by the American who went by the name of O. Henry, and there was a great story about a, a soldier return, a, someone returning from a, a, a war, and then it, then the penny dropped, and I thought, right, soldier returning from the wars to ancient Calabria, stumbles into a murder mystery. And then the research was really enjoyable because I couldn't go to Calabria because of COVID. Um, but I could read lots of things on Calabria. And I also, as pure research, immersed myself in Scandi Noir, both TV and novels. <laughs> so <laughs> the fact I watched all of the bridge, all of the killing, all of those, it was work. Brilliant. I love it. I've, I've, I've got, I know everyone says they've got a book in them, but I know I've got a book in me, but that's a perfect excuse to just sit around and watch watch trash on telly. I love it. Fantastic. Um, uh, Leslie says, uh, what's your, you mentioned the other historical writers, but who's your favourite if you sit down and write? Do you listen, Do you read historical fiction yourself? I uh, do. Other I, people's, I mean. I don't read my own. I get it goes through. <laughs> Um, I tend not to read historical fiction set in the classical world because, as I said a few minutes ago, it, I get so pedantic and it frustrates me when they get the anachronisms come in, um, especially when they dress modern people up as Romans or Greeks and they think in our thought patterns and that just... Mm. But no, I read a lot of historical fiction that isn't set in the classical world. Favourite writer, uh, two spring to mind, Patrick O'Brien. Mm -hmm. um, the 
uh, Jack Aubrey, Stephen Mature and yeah. series of novels, which I think are absolutely Fantastic brilliant. Books. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and in fact, even the, the film adaptation with Russell Crowe was, mm. I thought, very, very good. Yeah. Um, I love the way Hollywood changed it. So the bad guys weren't Americans who were getting their asses kicked by uh, English <laughs> sailors. They, they became French. Mm. Um, and the other one would be Mary That's Renault. Not a thing, Harry. I don't mind that at all. <laughs> <laughs> the other one's Mary Renault. Um, died. Oh, yeah. Well, died a long time ago now. Um, I don't. I wouldn't say she's forgotten, but she's um, her heyday of sort of sales and and top ten top ten status would have been probably in the nineteen seventies, I guess. But she did a brilliant trilogy on Alexander the Great, which. Um, are up there with O'Brien as just, I think, the best historical fiction ever. Okay. I've heard, I've definitely heard of that, and maybe mm. I've read them back a long time ago. Excellent. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, Nick says, um, everything you've learned while studying all the history that uh, that got your mind blowing and jaw dropping, is there something in history that's really surprises you or really surprised you? Um, yeah, loads of things. Um, unfortunately, when I've said loads of things, I can only remember the Can't most think of any of them. <laughs> I can only remember one thing, and that was about two months ago when I'm researching, well, I just started writing. I was then researching um, a new novel on Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd always thought my 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 image of ancient Greek women was that they were veiled, they were kept almost in the harem, in the women's rooms. They, they had a, no public profile at all. And then it became a jaw-dropping moment when I discovered that Macedonian women were absolutely nothing like that. And there was a strong tradition taken from Illyria, the next um, people, of actually training them in arms to fight and to lead um, troops in battle, uh, which of course, was a godsend for me in this novel. Because one of the problems you have setting novels in the classical world is it's very hard to have female characters ever do anything apart from be someone's wife or a victim. Uh, Finally, I could actually have some Macedonian women who actually could do stuff, who could actually, you know, participate in the main plot line, which was great. And yeah, there are probably hundreds of other jaw dropping moments, but I think we'll just go. Come back to that later. Yeah, no worries. They'll come back uh, in a minute. Oh, no, no, they will do. Well, that's fine. That's fine. We're here for a little while yet. Um, lots of comments in the chat, folks. There's a big row going on about whether a historic is written by the victors or what have you. Please be nice to each other in the chat. <laughs> it's getting a bit heated, I think. <laughs> oh my god, don't want to put any real yellow cards down on you lot. Uh, and Yorkshire Dragoon says we're doing really well. We're getting somebody, a guest who's got <laughs> something to plug. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I yeah. never go anywhere unless I've got something to plug. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, dear God. Um, I forgot to say right at the beginning of the show, thank you to everybody who's watching this on playback because um, we, we know we get an awful lot of people who do that. So we really appreciate that. And Ken gets annoyed and tells me off if I don't say that. Um, and also, uh, we did mention at the beginning, we are sponsored by Mezzas Minis. Uh, later on, uh, there will be a code which will give you 10% off from... Uh, from Carl's wonderful store. I think he's got a restock of Avon posts and VMVs there, some really good stuff. Um, but he, what does he not do, Martin? He does not do busts. He does not do busts. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so I'm going to go around the, around the room now. Is that, what sort of books would, if you could write a historical fiction, what would you do? What would you write? Oh, Steve, what's, right what period would you do? Well, as I've, I've dabbled in my own um, writing for uh, Flames of War, um, I'd probably do World War Two. Uh, oh. it's, it's just something that I know well. Um, what I found really difficult for that, though, was the stuff that I used to write for the rule books was they were all real people. It was oh. filler fiction based on actual oh. people. The, the, very, the very, very first one I ever did was about Charles Upham, um, and that was for the, um, the, the one of the British books. But I did. Um, there was there was Charles Upham. Um, God, so long ago, I've forgotten which ones I wrote. There was that. Oh, that um, Maria Tank Driver woman that I can't pronounce her surname. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote about her. I wrote about her as well. Um, there was a guy, a, a German parachutist on uh, Crete. Um, 
But I, I found it really difficult knowing that the, the things I was writing about were actual real people that actually did real life things in World War Two. Um, but no, if I had to do a, a fictional one, it'd be um, in World War Two, I think, which probably shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone, really. <laughs> Brilliant. And a very good, Lots very good choice because on, only various bits of history seem to work um, in the mass market of historical fiction. Mm. So Romans work, Vikings work, Tudors work. For some reason, the English Civil War is a complete no-no. It just doesn't mm. sell. Why? Who knows why? I mean, I don't know why. why? Um, but World War Two, World War One, and World War Two do, except in America, where nothing sells unless it involves Americans. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. Fair enough. <laughs> Seems to be the way of it, doesn't it? Yeah. If anybody in the chat, write down what what books you'd love to either have somebody write, or you'd love to write yourself on what period? Because it always fascinates me what people get excited about. Martin, what about you? I, I think I can guess, but yeah, on. I can oh guess. no, no, go on, no, no, go on, then guess, go on, guess. It wouldn't be War of the Roses, would it? No, no, it wouldn't. No, no it wouldn't. Okay, no, 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 it wouldn't because because uh, there's quite a lot. Well, I think there's quite a bit, although it's, it gets quite contentious. <laughs> um, does does <laughs> because everyone eventually has to um, has to, has to either pick a side or has to deal with the issue of a certain child murdering monarch potentially. <laughs> um, so 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 everyone has to come across that. So it, it's kind of you sit there. And that just sounds and, like a Netflix and that's, movie, and that's why oh, that's why that, that that series of books that um, the, the Toby Clements uh, books he stops in 1471 so he doesn't have to go on and deal with the situation <laughs> later you went no no i've done that nothing happened after Tewkesbury. it's <laughs> oh, nothing else happened <laughs> and it's all fine Finished. and um it, i think he only mentions like gloucester like twice and all he mentions is that his men were really brutal no uh, i would do something around the 30 years war um i, I would look at that because i think from from our from our from the perspective over here is that it wasn't a period I knew, really knew anything about. And I actually got into that period through wargaming and playing by fire and sword. And I know you wrote, bought the rule book. So uh -huh. I talked about it last week. Um, and it, it as a war gamer, this is a cool thing. You find out about new periods, um, you know, and um, I find it fascinating. All the political, the intrigue, once you get around, obviously the, the base conflicts, there's so many nations involved, there's so many participants, I, I think it could probably get quite convoluted. Um, but I think there's something there. And who doesn't like winter SARS? You could do oh, that's a very, very, very base, very base. Um, so man on a horse with wings. There's there's nothing wrong with wind. There you go. Are. That's Absolutely. that would be that would be mine. I don't know what I'd write about. I don't know how I'd do it, but that would be <laughs> <laughs> that would be the period you set it in. Yeah, well, you know, it's a start. At least you know the period you're going to set it in. Uh, what about you, Ken? What would you um, do? Yeah, Vikings, it's... Vikings, Ken. Vikings, Vikings Ken, or would, do, would it be <laughs> no, you know forty no, k universe? No. no. Um, it's an interesting one for me. So it'd be a toss up between like Steve World War Two, but I think I'd probably go with the Hundred Years War. Um, just because I, I love it, I just love that that time in the period. Um, I love the how strong the the U boat was, um, and I like I base it around that really. Um, not, I thought you meant I thought you meant the Hundred Years War then. I thought you meant what? the U boat in the Hundred Years War. <laughs> 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 That's a revision. Yeah, no, 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 no. yes. That's it. That but sounds no, like that sounds like a Hundred Years War film directed by Michael Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. But no, I'll go with that. What about, what about you, Dom? What would you go with? <laughs> Do you know, I, I, I've asked that question now. I'm thinking long and hard what I would actually set mine at. I, 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 as a kid growing up, I remember I was obsessed with books by Alfred Duggan. Don't know everyone. Do you ever read them, Harry? Yeah. Um, I Love loved. Them. Absolutely brilliant. They were the um, best. Read, read them, best ever. Read them as a kid. Um, yeah. Reread a couple a few years ago. They really stand up to rereading too. They oh, are fantastic. superb books, I, and they went out of print quite a long time ago, and then somebody start, started to reprint them, and I think that company folded as well. And I've spent years collecting every single edition of it, going around Hay and oh, all right. this. I, <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and I think I got every one in the end, but he did a series, um, Elephant and Castles was one of the editions, which was about Demetrius the Besieger from the Alexandrian successor. 
uh, period. And I've always loved the Alexandric successor yeah. period. And I would love to do a story set in that. Now, there have been quite a lot of very good books lately around that sort of period ish. Um, but I would love to do something on that. That, that really <coughs> excites me. And I think just the sheer interaction between all the different successor states and the rise and the fall of the various you know, Seleucids and the um the ptolemaics and all that would be a brilliant plot line for a for a running series i'd love to do that one day one day dom do, you know, dom do you know what i always thought i'm actually being serious now i'm not gonna mention badges or anything i thought your 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 favorite period would have been um based around like the american war of independence or the french indian war i don't know i just always thought that was your no, it's it's a weird thing. So that's what I se seem to play more often now. Anything Black Powder seems to be the thing that I play the most often. But the thing that kind of got me most excited in ancient, or in just general history, was ancient history. So a bit like Harry, I used to play um, WRG. I think I played fifth edition was the first one I did. And like, it was all ancients. We just played ancients, 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 15 mil ancients. And I was obsessed with everything to do with the Greeks uh, the Macedonian states, the uh, Scythians and Saka, and you know, absolutely loved all that. Just got me really excited. So now I, I would, and it's only I think I mentioned it, it last last week or the week before. I can't remember now. But when we're talking about rule sets, it's the bit that lets me down. I think at the moment within wargaming, it's really hard to find a decent set of ancient rules that I would love to play and get all my dust out all my ancient figures and play again because I love that period. All those periods are just brilliant. Sorry, Harry, I didn't much like the Romans, but, you know. <laughs> well, oddly enough, no one did I to kick off with. Oh, I, really? <laughs> I got into ancient... I was already, already into history, but I got into ancient history when my godfather gave me Robin Lane Fox's biography of Alexander the Great. Um, wow. It was a huge book, and I found it quite daunting. Once I started reading it, I loved it. So I got into the Macedonians and the Greeks, but then it was at university. I just had an inspirational tutor, a guy called David Schotter, mm -hmm. and he taught me Roman history. And I thought, well, actually, yeah, I'll go down that line. But, of course, for the next book, I'm going back to the Greeks because um, you, you need a change of bowling every now and then. Absolutely. <laughs> you certainly do. Uh, uh, SJMT60 says uh, Spartan women were quite prominent as well in history. They certainly were, weren't they? They had quite a lot of um, more rights than any other Greek uh, women in uh, of the era and pretty much any other era for many, many years before. But I don't think they didn't fight or anything like that, did they? I don't think. But they are, you telling, are you telling me that 300 isn't historically accurate? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I've got I, mean, know, I know it's based on the graphic novel because I'm going to get someone in the comments is going to come. I've got a hairy <laughs> rhino in my uh, eye army. I don't know about you. So, anyway. So. I'm now uh, a broken man, a broken man, and I'm going to burn my copy of it. <laughs> uh, women fought like the Thracians. Is that right? The Thracian women fight? <clears throat> I think they did. I think I vaguely remember. Best, not that I can remember the Thracian period, but I remember reading about that. But, uh, uh, Anthony says, uh, MNC makes a change. US movies love the Brits as a bad guy, especially if Mel Gibson is in the film. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> either, um, either, either Brits or South Africans. There was a long spell when every bad guy was um, an Africana, but it's reverted right. to every bad guy being an Englishman now. Yeah. <laughs> but have you, have you noticed, though, how in American films, I've been noticing this recently, especially World War II films, how every American is played also played by a Brit because we play Americans better than the Americans do. Yeah. Yeah. Band of Brothers. They're all American. Yeah. I mean, they're all they're all English. So all, yeah. yeah. all British. Yeah. Yeah. Was, and, was, and the Wire. I mean, half yeah, the, the yeah, Wire. Yeah. 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 Either, yeah. Either English or Irish. And when talking yeah. normally, it didn't sound American at all. Yeah. <laughs> Bizarre. So this is an intriguing question. JP says, "Ask Harry what he has against the Faculty of um, Philosophy." <laughs> I take it I, he knows you. <laughs> I I think he does. What um. We were playing a big war game of uh, the Spanish Civil War. Uh, I, I hope this is right. It could be just a person who thinks I hate philosophy. <laughs> uh, we're, playing, we're playing the Siege of Madrid, and um, for some reason I always get typecast as um, a fascist uh, 
Catholic zealot, usually le leading a raquette. <laughs> so I don't know why. And um, we 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 all had our own. It was a great game um, with some friends, and we all had our own personal victory conditions. And mine, as befitted an absolute religious lunatic, were I got victory points for making my mass, uh, making my troops say mass under fire, mm -hmm. which they did. Most of them died, but I got my victory points. And then I had to take the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Madrid and execute all the atheist dons there. Now, <laughs> having taught at lots of universities, I would it was a pure pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, re I'm really hoping that that was what the comment was, <laughs> as I've just admitted to a virtual war crime. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. JP, you have to tell us in the chat, please, what, what was that all about? Because that sounds hilarious. <laughs> Uh, imaginary conflict says he's reading Jack Redwall books again at the moment. Oh, Brian, uh, Brian Jakes. Yeah. Brian Jakes. Yeah, he. he um, you, you, you're, it's um, uh, it's mice and badgers and things. But it, it, to be fair, um, I remember reading those when I when I was a I was a kid. They were actually some of the first novels I went out and bought with my own money. I remember there was a book fair. Um, in the village I grew up in, in the village center, which is actually where I got my vaccine today. And um, and you know, I went in there and I saw all these books laid out and all these 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 mice. It also helped that the uh, one of the characters was called Martin the Warrior. That kind of helped. Uh, and um, uh, and they but they were they were written and they were not they're not like Watership Down where it's a chance. I mean, there is a whole mythology. It's a fantasy world. The mice have shields and that, but it, they were incredibly well detailed with their own history. And he based a lot of things on Tudor um uh, architecture which and and it, it's all set around a monastery called Redwall. and he actually was researching monastic life and he's so he basically just replace all the people like in the name of the roads just replace them with badgers and rats and mice and you pretty much got red wall <laughs> love it love it um peter says wasn't one of alexander's leading commanders a woman i don't know i I've never read that Maybe that's just uh, in one of your dreams, Peter. I don't know. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think so. No. Um, his mother murdered a lot of people and led an army. Mm, maybe that's where he. Is. That, that could be, yeah, because his mother, Olympias, does lead an army, as mm. do two other female relatives. I was thrown by the. Um, they're not really his commanders. It happens after he's dead, where during the uh, struggle for power. Right. Macedonian yeah. women, very capable of leading armies. They were serious. There was, um, up, weren't they? Alexander's mother was Angina Jolie, wasn't it? And, and <laughs> Alexander, <laughs> all, Alexander and all Macedonians had Irish accents. To be sure they did. Know. And also, <laughs> Colin Farrell's only about two years younger than her, which is a uh, bit of a problem yeah. for the son. Yeah. But... yeah. Details, I, details. I, I just, I will tell you one thing actually, just about those films. I, right, the, the, the first battle, I can't remember which. The first one against Darius um, in the film, I really liked how they portrayed that ancient battle because they, because because of how big it was, they had to put um, subtitles on the screen to say you're in the centre or you're on the flank, and I really enjoyed that one very small part of that very very long film and the Vangelis soundtrack. Um, but I really really liked it. We were talking about battle scenes. Um, few streams ago weren't we and I, i'd mm. forgotten all about alexander because there's certain parts that i've tried really hard to forget and um <laughs> <laughs> and um i and actually as far as battle scenes go i'd actually say that's one of the best battle scenes i think has been filmed for ancient warfare mm. i really do yep no i couldn't agree more great battle scenes i got really confused in that very long film because i could never quite work out where we were in alexander's story mm. um I don't, I don't think he had anything to do with Alexander, apart from the name of the, of the film, wasn't it? I don't, that's what I remember. I, rem I remember being, inc most my mates who I gamed with at the time, we were all so excited that there was going yeah. to gonna be an Alexander film coming out. And I think you're going to say what, my, what I feel. Go on, Dom. I think and we all rushed exactly. off to the cinema to watch it, and... Um, and we came out and we just had to go and drink about 12 pints of beer just to expunge it from my memory. It was quite yeah. It, it's not a, I, I, and credit, you know, uh, but the thing is, is that that film was meant to have been a, it was Oliver Stone's big love of it. Like he wanted to make mm. that for so, so long. And this is my personal opinion and um, other people may disagree and they probably <laughs> will. Right. I don't understand how you can take the life of Alexander the Great with all of his military campaigns and all of that. And I fell asleep <laughs> in that film. 
and, and um, I, I, fell, I fell asleep in between uh, and uh, I, I've tried watching it afterwards there's there's about five different versions of it now there's a director's cut and mm. a woman cut and all of this and I almost feel like it, it if it was chopped up and done as a 10-part series and you mm. could expand on out because it is too much there is too mm. much in that man's life even Probably for a three hour long film Probably and um, and I was hoping, but I don't know if because that film has now come out, if that's killed it and no one's going to touch it. Because there was another film that was being made at the same time uh, mm. by Baz Luhrmann. And if anyone doesn't know who Baz Luhrmann is, that's the man who directed Moulin Rouge. Um, and he was going to do it, but because all of us are stoned at it, he stopped production. So I've always wondered what a, a more a, another film would have been like. I just think it's a show, you know, I've, I've just noticed, obviously, with historical films that are coming out, obviously everything now sort of go, is, is sort of bending around to Vikings um at the moment um so i was wondering (laughs) (laughs) i'm I'm not believe it or not i am not a viking fan seriously Um, didn't know that no no no, i'm not a viking fan i just i i don't know enough about it and i don't yeah and every every time these lot can get a viking joke in they constantly do it harry all the time it's always (laughs) can it is a recommendation if you really want an accurate viking um Sort of background to, to 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 read. I recommend. I highly recommend this. It was, it, it, it was going on. Hagar the Horrible. That was um. <laughs> you can't go wrong with with Hagar the Horrible. Just that, uh, <laughs> lovely. Mm-hmm. Good That's recommendation. It, yeah. <laughs> my, you, I was going to say because like, there's got to be films out there. I know one straight away for you, mine that gets on your peas all the time, and I quite like it just for the fight scenes. And it's uh, the King on Netflix. No. <laughs> <laughs> is there any films, Harry, that you watch and you think to yourself, "This is just absolutely no"? What, what was going? What's going on with this? And for historical accuracy wise, it's just nothing like it. But can you name any? Um, well, I love the film, but Gladiator. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's a great movie, and it deserved to win Oscars. And the opening battle scene is fantastic, although the pyrotechnics are a bit puzzling. Mm, with, yeah. with 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 uh, yeah, with exploding things in the forest. <laughs> yes. um, it, it was, I mean, it, it was bizarre and it seemed to just ignore every, a lot about ancient Rome. Yeah. So um, yeah, the senators all end up as civilians, uh, but the hero is a sort of career soldier. And then at the end, Marcus Aurelius is thinking of restoring the Republic. Really? Yeah. Were, not, yeah. not terribly likely in 180 AD. <laughs> but only which I loved it. Um, but m- most, most, most historical films, you just sort of do wince and think, "Oh no." Yeah. It's easier, I think, if you're watching historical films about periods and, and cultures you know nothing about. Yeah, definitely. So I'm really, really keen on, on Kurosawa's samurai films, but of course, mm-hmm. I've only read two books in my life on the samurai, both written by Stephen Turnbull, because they always are. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it can be full of historical crazy anachronisms. I just don't know them. Yeah. 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 The closer you get to a period, the more you recognize all these things, don't you? Yeah. Well, I think it's that thing as well, because you you forget a lot more forgiving, don't you? Because ultimately, uh, like historical fiction, um, and films they're meant to be entertaining you, you ultimately you know you 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 want to show the film to someone who's not into necessarily history or things like that and then be entertained um you know so there are certain films i feel that, that forgive, forgive more like i don't and i said before i don't mind that robin hood film with russell crowe not because of the story but because of certain depictions of um of, 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 I don't mind that because the only one where he dies, and um, it's yeah. vaguely how he died. Uh, and I, I quite like parts of that. Um, Kingdom of Heaven, I, mm. I quite like, even though it's got some really big, big problems um, historically. But again, it's I find it quite entertaining because I, I like the. It, it, he tried to do that. That, that again, an all important, and it highlighted um, people like Baldwin. And uh, the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which has never been done, because it's always Knights Templar. I don't know, you have to put them in it. But it's always the men with the red crosses. And he put the Hospitaller in it. And, you know, they, they, they actually show people gathering in Italy. There was just little things like that. Um, we're watching that series called Barbarians at the minute on Netflix, all about um, the Teutoburg forest. Oh. Um, and the one thing that <laughs> made me happy, and I, I don't know if this is a... Just to be serious, but um, one of the main finds in the Teutoburg Forest is the the Roman face mask, the cavalry mask, and they actually put that in the series. 
like the character one of the characters is wearing it and i appreciated that it's a german series and they've enforced a language barrier the germans are speaking well, obviously german um but the romans are speaking latin and i i like i like that so but yeah i, I guess it, it, it's hard isn't it because you, ultimately you're trying to entertain a bit like a war game i you're gotta say I, I won't be adding anything to this conversation because I think I've mentioned it um, to death about what film, what film annoys me greatly. So I won't be mentioning <laughs> Fury, <coughs> Fury, <coughs> Fury. 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 Well, 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 yeah. Um, actually, uh, Andy, Andy makes the point. He says, wasn't the argument as I, in the Alexander film, wasn't the argument for the Irish accents that the Macedonians would say sound different to the Greeks who all had English accents? Yeah, it was, and it's a really good point. Um, yeah. It seems that Macedonian, although almost certainly a dialect of Greek, if um, hardcore Macedonians were talking Macedonian, Greeks seemingly couldn't actually even understand them. Actually, that was one of the bits I quite liked, the fact that all the Macedonians yeah. were Irish and um, the Greeks spoke in more BBC received English. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love the review. Was it in the Times when the film came out? Uh, the Alexander film came out, and it said there are many highlights in this film. They're all in Colin Farrell's hair. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It sounds like your philosophy attack was spot on, Harry. You were definitely that was the story that he was pointing <laughs> out. So you were you're found you're fine for the moment on that. There's been some great comments. Uh, I think Nick's gone a little bit crazy. He said Asterix and Obelix was the one that got into historicalism as a kid. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Well done, mate. I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with Asterix and Obelix. Don't get me wrong. I'm not sure about historical actors. I I have seen Asterix and Obelix, a picture from Asterix and Obelix, cited as a source in an archaeological report <laughs> because somebody <laughs> wanted to illustrate a Roman road and they couldn't find uh, or get a commit or, or, or get an illustrator to do one. And the picture from the but it was surprisingly accurate with the ditch next with the drainage ditch and the different layers because they were building it as Asterix and Obelix go down the road. Um, and it's for it's for a report in Colchester. Brilliant, fantastic. Solvent abuse says my missus likes Hillary Mantle books. I don't know them at all. Oh, uh, well, that's Wolf Hall and um, all about um, Cromwell. Thomas oh, Cromwell. okay, cool. Oh, good, I, good. I really I really enjoyed Wolf Hall and the second one, Bring Up the Body, so I haven't got around to reading the third one in the trilogy yet. Part of the problem is they're really hard to read in because they're enormous. And if you mm. want to relax and read it, you'll probably break your wrist doing it. Mm. Um, <laughs> and she does also have, especially in the first one, some, a really strange stylistic trick of he is always Thomas Cromwell, even though grammatically the he should be the Duke of Gloucester or someone who's just left the room. Mm. And uh, I actually use Hillary Mantel as a way of making myself feel better when I get a sense <laughs> of one-star reviews on Amazon. <laughs> and you do get an awful lot of them. Um, well, I do, anyway. Maybe most writers don't. Um, and, yeah, on the lines of you can't write. My, I, I then look up um, a writer I really admire and check out their one-star reviews. And Hilary Mantel has thousands of reviews for Wolf Hall and hundreds of them are one star, saying, uh, <laughs> my 10-year-old can write better than this. Hmm, yeah. possible. Oh, and uh, Patrick O'Brien had my favourite all-time one-star review for Master and Commander. It was one star, and the entire review consisted of, there are too many ships in this book. <laughs> 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 oh, oh my god they're out there folks they're out there. Uh, uh yorkshire Dugan says he occasionally writes stuff based on the very british civil war now that's an interesting period to try and to try and write books on although you could get an awful lot didn't, didn't some youtube channel get banned for yes doing videos um, on the very british civil war yeah it, it was he he took it into school and the school objected claiming it was not very nice material to be taken into school and it, it just got completely completely out of hand it was yeah. um i think they it it affected them i don't think that the channel was taken down i just think they were they were thinking of stepping away from it because of the all the shit that so, was flying yeah basically it, i mean I, I read the whole thing and i i i, I was speak i had no words it was just the most stupid thing i've ever i think i've ever seen in my entire life it was just bizarre utterly bizarre 
uh, Joshua had a really good idea uh, for a book, which is based on the Sino-Japanese uh, Sino War. Crazy conflict, not much understood. I think that mm. some of those uh, conflicts in Manchuria and what have you, fascinating. They'd be quite interesting. The period cover. I'd, I'd be interested in it. I'm not sure how many people would actually buy them, though. Probably too, too little under, under no, uh, understood. David said, "What about, uh, love to write Arthurian, historical, not Hollywood. Yeah, I, I the thing is the, the Arthurian one. Uh, there's a there's a series out in a bit, um, uh, in a moment. For one of the books is just called Lancelot, and that would recommend him to you yesterday. But um, and if his burn, burn, but that's it. But Bernard Cornwell's yeah. uh, The Warlord Chronicle, I still think is Bernard Cornwell's best series of books. Those three books: Winter King, Enemy of God, yeah. and Excalibur. I love, and um, and I still for the life of me can't work out if you, if you were going to do a series of any of his stuff, with the exception of obviously Sharp. Why those haven't been met? I just find those three books, mainly probably because there's only three, <laughs> you know, um, but um, they're brilliant. They're, and they, they do do that. And he does manage, he talks about all the, um, they go to, they go to all the old Roman towns and people are nicking the stone to go and build outside. And the Roman towns are like ghost towns, apart from some of the administration buildings where they're holding yeah. court. Um, some people are wearing togas still, but they, they consider themselves, they're, 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 Rome, they're still, you know, Romanite, well, not Romanized, but, you know, they're, they're still kind of following that way of life. I think he said it was all the people of Wales, maybe Gwent, I think he said, that everyone who was doing it. So, yeah, but more, there could be more. That's a great period. And actually the, um, the Pernicorn novels were used in a, a very excellent history book by Brian Ward Perkins, The Fall of Rome and the End of Civilization. He, he quotes one of the scenes when... Um, all the Arthurian warriors are busily um, approving something, so they're stamping their spears, and unfortunately, while doing it, uh, they're in an old Roman villa and they're smashing the mosaic under them to bits. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But no, Charles Christian's books are really, really good. Um, but I have to say that because he's one of my best friends. <laughs> yeah. Forces you to say it. Doesn't it? <laughs> Love it. He's on the other side of the room with the guy. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't give him three plugs, you know. yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's it. Thirty uh, friends of General Haig says uh, thirty year war would be great shout. An Englishman lost in Eastern Europe. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. There was some. There was some um, Scot. Um, there was Scottish over there. There were some Scots uh, over there fighting for the Swedish. I like Did any, does anyone remember a film set in the Thirty Years' War? And it sounds very unpromising. It starred Michael Caine and Omar Sharif, and it was called the the Last Valley, the Lost Valley. Yes. And it was actually incredibly good. I'm I, I probably historically massively inaccurate, but a band of mercenaries turn up at a remote community and then terrorise it. Um, I thought it worked really well. I'd love to check that out. I, but I like the idea, I like the idea. Of taking an Englishman and putting him in the Thirty Years' War because that might get you a chance of getting a publishing deal because <laughs> London publishers if, if they're no Englishman. Then, you know, Thirty Years' War. Huh? Yeah, you've got to... you, yeah, yeah. You, so because you, you, General Haig, go and wait and copy that copyright that one quickly because Harry's going to have that story if you're not careful. Yeah. Well, yeah. Didn't, um, you, you had some of the English Civil War commanders obviously served on the continent, didn't they? And then when they came back, yeah. they did that. So you, you, could you not then segue into the English Civil War series that everybody then needs? <laughs> <laughs> and he brings he brings over his Cossack companion, who Cossack Harper, you know. <laughs> rather than... Yeah, I'm going to write that one down too. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> GP says most of the English Civil War uh, I seem to find a rather black and white versions of characters, no nuance or complexity. Mm. Plus, they get all the details wrong. Yeah, uh, I, it's, English Civil War. I don't know why. I don't see anything covered properly. Uh, this doesn't surprise me, Leslie. Oh, I don't yeah. know why the Flashman yeah. novels got? Oh, <laughs> <really? Yeah. laughs> I mean, that, they are just classics, aren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. They some of some of the best historical fiction I've ever read, Flashman. I couldn't agree more. I remember my teacher at sixth form telling me I was never going to pass my history A level on my O level notes and reading Flashman novels. Luckily, <laughs> he was wrong. There's loads of history in them, <laughs> and they're brilliant. Some, also, some of the funniest books I've ever well, read. Yeah, they are hilarious books, aren't they? Really, really well done. Love them. 
Uh, imaginary composite, I'd write a series of novels centers around a Prussian soldier fighting his way through the late 1860s. The Prussia defeats Denmark, Austria, and then eventually France. Well, you've certainly got a nice run of wars there to fight through in a very short space of time. It would be quite an interesting one, wouldn't it? Quite brutal. It'd be quite a brutal series. I see Bernard doing that. I mean, it's, there's not an Englishman in there, so he'd probably struggle for a deal, as Harry says, but that would be kind of interesting. I, I don't think Bernard ever struggles for a deal, actually. No, probably not. Probably not. I think Bernard can write absolutely anything he likes. It's just um, the rest of us who... <laughs> One of the problems is you, you tend to get a bit typecast, because mm. I remember when I moved from Penguin to HarperCollins, and I said, well, here are the three Roman novels I want, we want to sell you, and can we also piggyback in a novel about World War One?" And all the creative people in the room, so the sort of head of fiction and things, seemed to be nodding and liking the idea about my World War I novel until the head of sales said the appalling words, but he's got no track record in this. It might not sell. <laughs> and and like a tsunami of disapproval got washed down the room. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> we'll stick, we'll stick with the three robot ones. Forget your World War I nonsense. Brilliant. Uh, Philip says uh, Greek mercenaries and antiquity would also be interesting setting because they moved around so much. It's true. You, you, yeah. you know, they fight in every army through that through I don't know hundreds of years. You could you could set them in pretty much any of those. It'd be a mm. be a really good series of books. That's for sure. Funnily uh, enough, it's, it's an idea I kicked around a few years ago, but never came to anything. I think it's a brilliant idea because, as you say, you can put them almost anywhere. Mm. Who was it did the series of um, Xerxes, was it Xerxes Retreat? Um, I, I can't remember. I read a book and it was about um, Greeks re uh, retreating out of Persia and then it followed his char this character all the way through. And it was it was really well done. I just thought it could have gone on and moved on to another stage of what happened to him next and everything else. But I don't know. I read so many books and I forget which, which ones I've read. Uh no, I'm not, not not dishing Clash of Spears, James. It's just it's that's a skirmish game, and I want a big battle. That's that's what I was saying really about that. I'd like a big, big battle. Uh, bah, bah. Shall we? Loads and loads of comments. Thank you so much for everyone doing it here. Should we move on to some of the? Give Harry a break. And get, get his taste buds going again with another cup of brew or whatever he's got there. Should we do um, some of the news and things we've seen this week? Yeah. Yeah, break it up a bit. Um, a grab a drink, Harry. Good idea. Oh. Uh, Oathmark human cavalry figures. I know a lot of people are into Oathmark, as I am actually. It's a great system. Uh, they're bringing out the cavalry, they go on sale this week, I believe. Mm -hmm. yes, like yes, 15 in that box. That is really, really good. Yeah, yeah. good value, isn't it? So you get uh. 15 cavalry, including an officer and a standard bearer. And I think they're doing army deals as well, aren't they? We can buy three or four boxes. It's pretty cheap. Pretty cheap. The horse, the horse poses are all right as well. They're not too over dramatic. No, they're quite nice. Yeah. I don't quite they, like those. They're nice, they're nice on the nice charge. I really like those shields. Square, the sort of rectangular ones. Yeah, they're kind of yeah. cool. I like them. Yeah. It's a bit different, isn't it? And then you've got to see, it looks like some archers at the back um, as well. Ooh, yeah. yeah, I think you're probably knowing them. You can they probably got options. Oh yeah, just say uh you can make them all spearmen, all hand weapons and shield, or archers, or all combinations of the three. So you can split them up however you like. Uh, oh, quite cool. no, Pretty no, smooth. No. Um all games Atlantic have said their next two releases are going to be um whatever these Panzer Jaeger future war stuff is and the late yeah, Roman the legionaries. They do a bit, don't they? <laughs> they do. They certainly do. Uh, late Roman legionaries there. And then they're saying the next few are going to be World War One stroke two French, cannon fodder and goblins in the next week or so. And then they, they have some random, random releases, oh, yeah. don't they? <laughs> don't they? Yeah. I mean, look, well, hang on. Hang on, who is it? No, it's so they're doing late Romans at the same time as uh Victrix, yeah, yeah. Well, Victrix is still gonna be a while before they release this. Now, Victrix will be ages yet. Be <laughs> that ages could be really that go. could be interesting. I want to see that. That uh, uh ooh. could you mix them together? They could have right. you no know, bastardization. Talking about Victrix, they've got their Norman infantry coming out 
uh, this week, I think. Next week, sorry, it says there. Next week. They're better. So they look really nice. They're better. They, they are very nice poses. <laughs> I like yeah. last week's. Ah. Yeah, they, uh, they, were, <laughs> they did look a bit quasi modo last week, didn't they? Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> they weren't good at all. Uh, friends, the Perrys, they've got yeah. some uh, Prussian 1806 Prussian Fusiliers out. Four more um, codes of those, all metal. Again, as always, Perrys do such fantastic figures. They'll look great. Our friends, the Perrys. Our friends, the Perrys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They won't. They they won't write to you anymore, will they, uh, Ken? They just no. refuse to. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the Mezzers on. I haven't seen him on the in the chat, but I saw that his mate in uh, Greece has got these new Greek rebels for the Greek yeah. War of Independence. So I assume that they'll be available through Mezzers Minis. Um, because that was actually what I asked for in the, you know, the uh, Atlantic did the um, yeah. poll of what you wanted next. And I said Ottoman Napoleonic type, because you could play Ottomans, they, uh, the same sort of troops could pretty much apply through about 200 years. They didn't change significantly. And these kind of look like they could do. I mean, they say here they could use them for Ottoman fleet crews or Mediterranean pirates. Uh, they look quite sweet. So uh, that's coming up. Um, blah, blah, blah. The one I know we chatted about a lot in the oh hang on no this one before we go on to that so uh, oh, new yeah. osprey book absolute emperor napoleonic oh, yeah. which is just just launched don't know what it's going to be like um, osprey rules tend to follow a very formulaic process don't they I, I don't know I'm not overly keen on them my own myself but I know a lot of people do so I guess they'll be and they're always a good price twelve ninety nine for a a rule book is not to be sneezed at. Sorry, Ken, you were about to say something. No, no, no. I've got a Kickstarter to show off um, when, you, Go for when it. you're finished. Yeah. Go for it. Okay, yeah. I, shall, I shall show it off. Where is it? There we go. All right, I'm sharing. So, so got some 6 to 18 mil scales here. Um, so, 3D printed. And uh, yeah, so you messaged me about these to be fair, and I, I didn't know much about it, so I clicked on here. But I'll show a little video here. Okay. Interesting. It's a bit cartoony. They're six mil. Oh, are they? Oh, that's damn yeah. good. Six mil. That's a nice sculpt for a six mil. That's what I mean. That's what I mean, they're six mil. Uh, but with 3D printing, you can scale them. Yeah. So you can scale them up, and they come in the strips. And there's all all the different nations. Swedish. Oh. Yeah, Swedish. So, so what's he asking for on Kickstarter? What's his... Um... Price-wise, I think they're quite reasonable, to be fair. Um, I'll click across, but just show you the editor there. So you can change it, put Shakos on, all that sort of jazz. Put the cross belts on yourself. So it's a bit of everything. But mm. price wise, I thought it was quite reasonable. So you can go one army's ten quid, but if you want everything, forty five pound. And they're all that's, yours. That's, that's not, bad. not bad at all. That's not bad at all, that. No. Six mil, well, no. For a whole army. So basically you've got every design every, you could want. Every, every design you're ever gonna want, you three D print them. Mm. Um and and they're they're, that's it. There's, your, there's all your troops, and like I say, they're customizable as well. So if you want to um, put put uh, put bear skins on uh, other units and stuff like that, mm. do Austrians. You could do Hungarians as well. Change the helmets over to Shakos. Um, yeah, you can do it. And uh, it's got 21 days to go. And he's he's. I think he's only just opened it up. So yeah, check that one out. I'll put a link in the chat now if people are interested in it. Mm. Speak, speaking of small scale do you remember um you uh, i showed you guys that thing i found on instagram do you remember those 10 mil crazily detailed oh. proto viking things i was on instagram today and i just noticed he'd done this and uh, so this is where he's, he's done cavalry now they're, oh, 10, mil, they're, they're 10 they're 10 mil <laughs> oh my god <laughs> and it's actually they're 10 Jeez. or 15 you can scale them because these are free these are all 3d print files as well yeah so you can see they're on strips but yeah i i, I oh, just oh my 
God. Yeah. That's got that's got to involve some kind of witchcraft going on there. I, that's not normal. <laughs> no, yeah, I know. I I just yeah. I, I just that that was my quadruple. I, I was just going through today and I saw those. Holy, I, I, just, I just just going to point this out quickly. Leslie's asking me how my six mil samurai. I don't have any six mil samurai. Yeah, Leslie. wrong people. Uh, wrong it's people. Me, it's me and Martin who've got the six mil samurai, and we still haven't done. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so, <laughs> they are all. They're all over, right. They're all over here. They divide. Look, look, they're divided up into little trays, mm -hmm. depend with lollipop sticks um, that I'm looking. At. And I, I basically I looked at them this weekend, and I thought I could do those. Uh, and then I painted Warhammer. <laughs> so you were secretly at that convention when we were saying the other week. So you were at an Age of Sigma tournament. Do you know what? I, I, do you know what? Okay, I, I, it's just because like we had the game, and I was like, oh, I just, I just need to paint something that I can paint. I just want to go. I just want to do something weird. So I'll paint up these guys as statues because all I did was I got clippers and started just hacking pieces off of them. And yeah, I thought yeah. it doesn't matter because they're statues. So I'm just going to do that. Um, and it was really therapeutic. Going, I'm going to I'm going to mangle this model and paint it. <laughs> and, and, and it's and people can't say that you know it's broken because I'd say no, they've been turned to stone <coughs> by Medusa or something. Is it Medusa? Uh -huh. <laughs> that was. My oh dear do you know what do you know i'm painting these lands next tonight i don't know mm. whether this, this is subliminal or not but the last thing i always paint is the cod piece i just i don't <laughs> know what it is it's not truly finished until you've done the cod piece. <laughs> no but oh it, see we just had the facebook page calm down with you and your cod piece and now you're going <laughs> to start it all back off again no, i just i just noticed i'm, I'm almost finished these eight uh well the, the, the block painting and the only thing I've, I haven't painted so far is the the archibus and the the cod piece. <laughs> Very strange. Anyway, would, that, move, yeah, moving on. <laughs> yes, that would be that would be a nice period as well. Actually, you know, sort of like the you know following land snakes around yeah. on their very, yeah, various various things. I mean, anybody who got involved in lots of mercenary wars would be kind of good, wouldn't it? Generally, I can't imagine they were very nice people though. I mean, we... <laughs> oh, oh, no. Probably making them Americans or something then. Uh, so Great Escape <laughs> Games went on sale tonight. Everyone, know, I know loads of people got excited about plastic cowboys. Yep. And they are probably already sold out. So the advanced <laughs> pre-order went up tonight. 15 quid, I think it was, for for 10 models, something like that. Was that right? Something like yep. that. Yeah, 15 for 10 multi-pose plastics, um, <sighs> which will be an in which is a gang plus three guys to to keep you going and that's really nice cover art as well very nice cover yeah. art i, I, I think they were doing various box sets as well weren't they some you could get the rules with them and all sorts of yeah they've done lots of deals lots oh, of deals no no <laughs> <laughs> that in the background is steve realizing that he's going to buy even more stuff this week uh, <laughs> uh harry had this one um so partisan actually happening for real Harry, yep, in good. October. Yep, got an um, email from Lawrence and Trix who run it, and um, yep, they're going ahead, which is great. Um, as I was saying before the show, it's one of my favourites of uh, all the war game shows. Um, so let's hope, fingers crossed, it can you know, go ahead, thanks to the vaccination programme. Yep, superb. I think that'll probably be one of the first big shows in the UK that's going to happen yeah. this year. From yeah. what I've heard, so that's yeah. really exciting. Follow closely yep. behind by uh, the second best show that's going to be happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Crackle. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. How I, forget? Crackle. I wanted how long it would take you to do that. Yes, uh, yes. I forgot. someone was asking earlier what's happening with Crackle, and we'll get onto that later, probably. Uh, the other one I was going to highlight, and we know I know we talked a lot about this in the uh, Facebook page, which reminds me if you want to join the Plastic Crack. Facebook page, go along, answer the three simple questions and join the fun and games there. <laughs> so the fact Frontlines is up for sale. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Front rank, sorry, front rank. Front rank is up for sale. I don't know. I noticed that you only mentioned this after you've bought out all their stock. <laughs> it's true. It's true. They have nothing left after I placed two <laughs> rather large orders this week, but this is true. Oh, dear God. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I, I think it's, it's almost, you know, I know, so the, the couple that run it are retiring. Basically, they want to retire and, you know, good for them. They've done it for a long, a long time. And I think front rank are some of the nicest figures out there on the market, um, personally. 
uh, certainly for metal figures. I know Steve will probably spit in his, uh, <laughs> his coffee about metal figures, but whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, interesting. So they're up for sale. Hopefully, somebody buys them and they continue doing the really nice, nice models because it'll be a shame to lose them out of the hobby. Mm. Um, but I was suggesting we should do a little, you know, crowdfunding process and. Um, Get everyone on the plastic crack to contribute 10p and then um, we can get ken and laura so just forget about their, their house move and move up into the factory my so i just yeah. use my mortgage money to buy, yes, your mortgage to buy yeah. i'm yeah. sure she'll be fine with it i'm sure laura won't mind <laughs> at all about she'll that. be she'll be fine <laughs> dom and i noticed in the advert it said they had thirty five thousand pounds worth of stock are you trying to halve that in the space of two weeks <laughs> Done my best, mate. Done my best. What can I say? It's the only fair thing to do. And when I realised they were going, you know, they were being sold up, I thought, I know it did say underneath, don't worry, we've got plenty of stock. I thought, I'm not chancing it. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 50 or 55 today. I've probably hopefully got a few more years left to pack gain. I'm going to need lots of these figures, for Christ's sake. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's, I think, most of what we've seen this week, unless anybody else in the chat has anything else. There's some interesting stuff coming up, so some interesting developments, some new stuff. Somebody said in the chat, and I've lost it already, uh, about time we had the Perrys back on. <laughs> yes, it's about time. Yeah. Yes. There you go. About time the Perrys came back on. It was James. There you go. I know. It's true. It's true. We Thank have we have that. we have this thing knowing Batman, they have that big that big lightly shiny air with the Batman symbol on. We just yeah, we have a big light, it's got a big P on it. <laughs> you shine it into the sky and it means the Perrys are coming back on. So yeah. What's the space? Get the light working. <laughs> of course uh, of course Crackcon being in Derby is just down the road from Nottingham. So, you know, you can to sort exactly. of wander over there and harass them over there. Anyway, yeah, 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 we'll go over there. Everyone else can go to Crackle. We'll go <laughs> <laughs> so I think somebody was asking about um, uh, Crackcon earlier on. I've lost the comment, sorry. Uh, but yeah, more details to follow. We're still finalizing it, but we're still on for the 16th of October in Derby. Uh, um, details to follow. So I think what we will we'll probably do, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, we will um sell the tickets through the facebook page so make sure you're a member of that um That's and uh, there will be limited numbers clearly because it's the first time we're running it and we have no idea how many people are going to come yeah. um so we want to make it a fun experience for people who do come so we can just have a, a bit of a game and a yeah. laugh, meet people really. i think the uh, the idea yeah we would announce it through the facebook page and there would effectively be almost like a pre-sale through uh through the facebook page um and uh or for members of the plastic crack podcast or if you're not on facebook we will find an alternative way to do that um and there would initially be sort of one ticket per person so that everyone who watches the stream and who who takes why that would have the opportunity and then after a set amount of time it would then open up to multiple tickets i think that's the yeah the sort of the plan time. and then when we see uh, because obviously we've we, 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 we don't know what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> generally. generally. <laughs> um, so we, it, obviously the response so far, the emails and messages that, we, that we've had um, has been um, it, it's been immense. Um, so it looks likely that we will then do another one and we'll obviously look at scaling up the number of people. We just didn't know how many people would be interested or even if we're actually going to like each other in person. So, um, you know, that's that's a big thing. So um, we're also because Octo it's October, we hopefully there will be you no know, restrictions will be completely open. And, you know, we but we've we will be completely guided by the restrictions of the hosting venue. So um, if they say, no, you're limited to 30 people and that's it, plus us guys then that'll be 30 we'll have to give those chance and then if guests count towards that limit because it's to do with how many people they can have in there their insurance and all sorts um if if that changes and they they say you know you can bring some extras then and they can pay on the day or they're free if they're kids or, or whatever um we'll, we'll just be guided by them so we will get you more details as uh, as we can and I won't be turning. I won't. I won't be turning up dressed like a land snack, just despite what I promised the other week. No, we no. We just saw it on Facebook, didn't we, the other day? It was a badger, and you just dropped the mic after you. Like, oh yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely a badger suit. Land snack, mm, badger suit. Imagine you, getting a getting a badger suit in my height. That that's going to be a pretty niche, uh, a pretty niche fancy dress costume right there. 
<laughs> I think we need to move on from that right now. I've had enough thought about uh, badgers and cod pieces. How, how, how are you getting on with your uh, your otter, Dom? Do you know, I, I genuinely was looking for it today to prep it, it, it is. and I can't find <laughs> it. <laughs> it's somewhere here. But do I don't otters, know where it is. <laughs> do otters, Dom, do otters migrate? Uh, oh, could be. That's where it's gone. It's obviously where it is. Harry, they give me such a hard time. This this badgers <laughs> and burrows bloody game. They're driving me insane with it. Proper historical gaming should only be allowed in this channel. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, instead of that, I get badgered all the time. Anyway, uh, oh, 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 there we go. Peter uh, Peter Little um, hasn't had a little question of the week for a little while, but he had one for you, Harry. He said, uh, if you had to choose between fiction or non-fiction, what would you choose? I, I assume in terms of reading, your de your, um, and would your day job of lecturing and teaching actual history affect that decision? So if you had a choice, what would you sit down and read yourself? Um, well, I tend to always read um, one history book and one novel at the same time. Um, he said, in a, in a shifty politician-like evasive <laughs> answer. It's all right. Um, we're not going to hold you to it. Nobody's listening. It's fine. <laughs> um, I'll probably go with fiction, actually. Yeah. Yep. And what's um, on your bedside at the moment in terms of a book? Um, Rereading Mary Renault's The Bull from the Sea, a novel about Theseus and the Mycenaean world. And the other one, the the history, the, the non-fiction book, is a work on art history called The Alexander Mosaic by a woman called Cohen. I can't remember her first name. Ada Cohen. Um, because I'm researching Alexander, I've got quite into art history over the last few years. Not, um, well, not so, as I said, out to get into it, just because my colleagues at Lincoln College, Oxford, um, tend to talk really interestingly about it. And they know a lot about it. So you thought you'd better um, find out a bit more about it? Yeah, absolutely. Just to uh, have lunch with them. And then, then, <laughs> then, my bo then my boss, Professor Bert Smith, when I actually dared write and publish some stuff on art history, I showed it to him first. And I went, is it all right? And he went, of course it's all right. It's art history. You just make it up. <laughs> 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 and you thought, if only somebody had told me 20, 30 years ago, I would have moved into that a long time ago. Exactly. Oh, my God. <laughs> Brilliant. So what? Um, in terms of what you're working on now, in terms of, you know, what we might see as a historical fiction, what's sort of on the on the drawing boards that you can tell us that might be coming out fairly soon? Well, right. Um, well, I've already done one plug, haven't I? For the, yeah, for yeah. The well, you might as well do another one. Still got two more. Still got yeah. two more. Do um, did, I, did, I mention, did I mention the return is out in paperback on Thursday? Um, <laughs> you might have done. You might have done. <laughs> I might do again in a minute. Um, my next novel is out in, I think it's the end of September this year. It's called The Burning Road, and it's a Warrior of Rome novel. It's set in Sicily, and I'm desperately trying to remember the elevator pitch that actually sold it to the publisher. Um <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know what they say about it. They say it's Cormac McCarthy's The Road meets Gladiator. Because everything in the world of publishing has to be X meets Y and they have nothing to do with each other. Right. Um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> the, oh, it's, it. and, except for a few years ago when everything had to be just like Game of Thrones, only better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um Oh, Red Burning it. Road, it features Ballista, the hero of the Warrior of Rome series. And in 265 AD, he's shipwrecked on the west coast of Sicily. And unfortunately, there's a massive slave uprising going on. And to make things a bit, another turn of the screw, he's got one of his sons with him. And he's basically got to get across Sicily and save both of them and then hopefully save the whole damned island. Um that's a lot of fun. It's one of the few I knew, I know exactly where the inspiration of the novel comes from. Mm. One line in an ancient um, biography of the Emperor Gallienus, which just says, and there was a slave uprising uh, at this time on Sicily. And I thought, blimey, I didn't know that. And then I looked into it and found there was no other evidence for this 
slave uprising at all. And then I thought, well, it's a novel, so I don't really care. As wearing the historian hat, I don't think this slave uprising probably happened, as I admit in the historical afterward. Right. But I've always wanted to set a novel on Sicily, and I've always wanted to take Ballista, my long-serving hero, there, and um, give the poor old bucker a really bad time. <laughs> do you, I mean? Do you, I love the fact that you know all these all these books have these wonderful strong characters. Well, sometimes they're strong; they're sometimes slightly broken, aren't they? In some ways, um, but do, do you sort of feel slightly guilty about putting them through some of the things you put? I know they're not real, obviously, but you know, in terms of your mind, are you thinking, oh, "I can't do that to him," and then, "Oh yeah, I can. I can bloody do that to him. He's gonna, you know." Yeah. <laughs> Especially with Ballista, because I, I really like Ballista. And I, because he set out, he's always, when I first thought of him, his basic character was the Humphrey Bogart character from Key Largo. Uh -huh. yeah, the bloke who is forced to be a hero but doesn't want to be a hero. And every time in every novel, I force him to step up and be, play the hero again. I do feel guilty. Um, all he wants to do is go home, live in Sicily, eat fish dinners. You know, have, have a nice time, read a few books. And every novel, you know, he has to save the world again. <laughs> I love it. I love it. But it I mean, well, it was yeah. Martin, Am Martin Amis who said, you novelists only really write novels so they can just invent people and then make them suffer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's true. Well, well, you I, I, saying, yeah, that's mm, nuts, Carry on. No, no, God, that's what I was going to say. It's just that... Um, yeah, with some of the novels. I, I finished the um, all the Shardlate books quite recently, um, CJ Sanson. And what he put those people through, what he puts them through is an author. You're like, I'm pretty sure anyone who's been through this would not be a functioning human at the end of this. And what this guy's been through, like he was on the he's on the Mary Rose. He then gets caught up in <laughs> Ket's Rebellion. Um, and he's a hunchback, so he he can't read. He, in he's you know he's old. He's a hunchback. He's he can't really do very much. So he just gets kind of tortured and thrown around a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I um I did have to put a health warning in the back of um a ballista novel, The Last Hour, um, pointing out that if you do try and jump off the top of the Castel San Angelo in Rome, you won't land in the River Tiber, you'll get splat on the pavement. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't do it. <laughs> Whereupon I got an amazing one star review saying, Well, that really cool book for me. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Oh, love it, love it. Oh, See, that's geez. what I like about about Flashman. When, when, whenever the books start, he's always he's always just you no. Know, it's a run over from the last book, and he, he's just living a nice quiet life. And then someone does something, and the next thing you know, he's he's just launched into just the most mad adventures. It's I just I just think that's so so funny. I always feel. <laughs> I always feel I sorry love, for him. I, I love the one when, um, is it Flashman's Lady, when they kidnap his wife, and his opinion is they could keep her. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, lovely. Lovely, lovely. Uh, Kaiser says, of course, all Sula wanted to do was go home to his farm after washing the blood out of his clothes. <laughs> maybe not Sula. Uh, maybe not Sula. I, I, I'm no expert, but there you go. Uh, Andy says, don't academics only read essays to students to make things up and make the assistant professors suffer? I don't know. Is that, is that true? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, I discovered that after 20-odd years of teaching Cicero and Catiline, the Catalinarian conspiracy, I was the one making things up in tutorials because I was so <laughs> bored. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think there's, there's a shelf life of how long you can teach the same little bit <laughs> without either going mad or, or just losing the plot. Oh, love it. Love it. Oh, dear. Brilliant. I think, gentlemen, it is time for us to have... Oh, hang on. Before we do, we have a um, Messrs. Minis, uh, the code. I should put that at the bottom of the screen. So as I mentioned before... <laughs> This uh, stream comes to you, care of Mezzas Miniatures. Pop over there to Carl's uh, shop to buy your oven post and V&V um, &V and other stuff that he's got. Brilliant service always with Carl over there. And if you put this code in there, you will get 10% off and tell him you came from us, please. Um, 
So um, let's have a look at some of the pictures that were put up on the uh, Facebook page this week. Um, some really interesting bits and bobs went up. Uh, lots of you sticking up there. So I haven't got everything, I don't think, but uh, we'll whistle through a few. Um, please put more up there. And as a reminder, if you want to join the Facebook page, please do uh, just answer the three little questions and we'll love to see you there. Uh, so I was taken by this one. Um, what do you think of this, boys? This is Bjorn. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Okay. This was yeah. hand-built can he did. And he did some little cans as well uh, as for little drop-off points and what have you. Oh, it's really cool. What's that made from? I don't know. I guess it's little gr gravelly oh, stones. I, re I really hope it's cork. Because then Steve would make fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if it was cork, Steve would be sniffing it'd be that. Bad. It'd, be, it'd be like Rice Krispies or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that I don't know. That looks like little pebbles. Doesn't yeah, it, it genuinely yeah. looks like pebble pebbles. Kitty litter, kitty litter, kitty litter. Oh kitty right, litter. yeah. I use that on my my lunch neck basis. Um, not like not like that though. I just use the odd rock. But yeah, it's a very versatile material. Just don't get it second hand. It's disgusting. <laughs> Good safety you tip. You and my cats Thank it. you. <laughs> Andrew showed off some of his uh, American War of Independence militia that he's working on. Perry miniatures. I've got some of those. They're really, really sweet. Uh, what else we got here? John, uh, that was really awesome little model. Yeah, there. Star Wars. It's, yeah, Star it's, Wars. Um, yeah, it's uh, from the objective set. It's um, one the of the trade, uh, trade, trade Vice Federation. Yeah. yeah, that was John. Really, he put up a few there, really, really interesting little models. I don't know much about them, but they look really sweet, so I'm going to stick them up there. Uh, Joshua, those nice. look like some seriously yeah. good medieval figures. They're, um, clay, they, they're Claymore. They're Claymore, they? I think. Yeah, they are Claymore. Yeah, that guy pulling his knife out of his belt while he's holding the pike is fantastic. Clay, Claymore do some seriously nice stuff. Um, I, I, if we're going to um, if we're going to sort of plug any other channels, Medieval Warrior has got mm. a chat coming up, a live uh, a live stream with the Claymore casting guy on Saturday. Um, oh, cool. So, because uh, I believe, because he's been dropping lots of hints on his channel. Um, I think he's going to do the Scottish War of Independence. I think he's going to go William um, Robert Bruce and William Wallace. What of, what of 2022? A <laughs> uh, bit political there. Um, Andy uh, put up these. These look sweet as well. don't know what manufacturer that's, they are. Um, they're Frostgrave. That's Northstar. Yeah, uh, okay. North yeah, I thought, yeah. Really nice. Nicely done. Nicely done indeed. Uh, Matt was another one who got a game in this week. He was playing some Saga Age of Hannibal. They do look nice, those Romans down there. Looks like it's a... Oh, no, there's some Greeks up there, isn't there? Don't know what they are. He didn't say what the battle was between, but it looks like Romans against Greeks. Uh, Paul had some Zulus. That was one Very of his... Cool. Uh, I can't remember. He did say what that was called, but I've forgotten already. So. He Is it a heliograph? Is that it? I think that's it. I think you're right. Absolutely right. Uh, Brendan showed off his South Essex, and if you nice. can see, there's a hey. certain sharp gentleman on the right there that he's that he uh he scratch built is. in there. So he should be in the center, though, shouldn't he? Oh. <laughs> he's with the light company, he's with the light company, he's true, yeah. he's with the light company. That's company. very true. That's a good yeah. shout. That's a there very good go. shout. There you well go. done. Well done. I was right about something. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll finish the stream right there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, Sean showed off these. In fact, he did a video showing these off the other day. This is some of his uh, uh, Roman. Uh, I think he was planning to use them for so. No, he was going to use them for. I forget. I oh, know infamy. He was going to use them for infamy, and then he said he was going to reuse them as uh, for Warhammer Ancient Battles, which I really must say I'm going to dig out and play again because I do like Ancient Battles. We could have a game uh, on Wednesday, Dom. Yeah, that's true. I have to try and remember the rules, though, mate. That could be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh Steve with his six mil uh stuff. This is O Group uh Germans. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Which um I have got the rules. Surprise, surprise. And I am gonna have a read of them one day. <laughs> uh some Frenchies from uh from Robert. I like that. Uh which is rather good, rather nice model. Stephen, I have no idea what they are. Oh, they're um, they're Cordor from Necromunda. Okay, really sweet. Very nice indeed. 
And we've got Warren is just <laughs> trying to wind me up. I can, tell. <laughs> I can tell Warren is just trying to wind me up. And um, I'm in too good a mood. I've had a large glass of red wine. It's my birthday. Got Harry on here. It, so it is for a you. game. It, they are enemies yeah. in the game. They are. They're in Rangers of Shadow Deep. <laughs> Giant toads. Do you know? Do you know what's even better is that people are going out of their way just like painting. Oh no, that's, that's, that's the wine dollar. Young. They are. Oh, they no. absolutely <laughs> are. What's amazing though is um, I don't know. Uh, that, you know, by the time uh, you know the con rolls around, there's going to be so many that we might actually have to put on a large battle, a large <laughs> mass <laughs> battle <laughs> badges of badges of badges, and we just just take a historical, like an actual historical battle, take something and then just but just change it to I don't know. You could do yeah, oh, do boss like Yeah, yeah. We, we could do oh. Towton. <laughs> Yeah, Touters, yeah. That's the what was sixty percent of the badger population is killed. Oh Jesus <laughs> Christ! Help me. This is Tony's uh, cursed city. I think he said it was. Yeah, it's yeah. Sweet. Um, and vampires on there. Nick. Uh, oh, which is Legion. Yeah. Now he um, did a video about these. This is a um, Kickstarter, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah it's a great game. game. It's a great game. It's uh, Reich something. Uh, Reich, Reich, it's Reich Busters. It's basically Wolfenstein. Uh, if, it's, it's basically <laughs> weird World War. Um, it's 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 a lot of fun. You know, you go in. It's a cooperative game. Um, you, my, my mate's got it. We've played it. You go in. You you know, you clear the rooms. There's all sort. There's there's Nazis. There's Nazi experiments gone wrong. There's dogs with bombs strapped to their heads from the depths of hell that chase you obviously it's really historically accurate and um <laughs> there's big there's big nazi mechs it's just it's but it, i tell you what the mechanics of the game it, it, it's a lot of fun and it's one of these ones that it, it is hard but it it doesn't punish you so hard you don't want to play it again if that makes sense because i've got a couple of these games where we've played them like board games and, and the game just pummels you so hard you're like you know what? i'm not even gonna bother getting it out of the box <laughs> because <laughs> sweet yeah i don't i mean i love the models i have no idea what they're all about but what the hell there you go uh leslie said helograph team dom yeah i oh uh, yeah okay all right i know look yeah yorkshire says the same i know just ridiculous <clears throat> um apparently those uh, somebody was saying they're not um yeah it's the same sculpt it's the same sculpt though, I think. they're really nice models i can't yeah. say it but they're really really good really good models so ken will be able to say it ken you yeah, say go it. on ken what anti say that anti anti-diluvian i think it is but anti-diluvian anti yeah, yeah the anti-diluvian i had one of those i couldn't pronounce her name <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, crossing obstacles said yes it's his, it's his ken and it was made with kitty litter yay <laughs> so you you called it right there you go that's really impressive hey well well brilliant some fantastic work there as ever from everybody thank you so much for putting your stuff up so we're coming towards the end of the show which has gone by rather rapido <laughs> well i've drunk a large glass of wine, so I probably need a refill. You say funny. words like rapido. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it, is your, it is your birthday. Don't you have to drink as many shots as you are as you are old in years? So, <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be dead. Uh, isn't it? <laughs> I think that's. We still got. We still got. Se we still got seven minutes. We still got seven minutes left. Yeah, I have got to go to work tomorrow. So um, here we go. We got some decorum coming. Oh, and ask the question for Harry. If you were to recommend three authors to get into historical fiction, who would it be? Now, you can't be you. One of them has to, you know, we're, we're assuming that you is. <laughs> it's not me followed by me followed by exactly. me. Exactly. Yeah. Um, who are the, who, who else do you admire? I'm trying to think who else, apart from Patrick O'Brien and Mary Reno and Alfred Duggan. Mm -hmm. Um... Do you like Bernard? Do you like Bernard's books? What's your I like view? Bernard, I like Bernard's books. I, I like Bernard's books very much. I find all his heroes a bit modern in their attitudes. Um, I'm desperately trying to think. There's a brilliant Frenchman who's who just republished all his books. They're about the Hundred Years' War, oh, I like and he was a hero of the Resistance. Maurice Druon, mm -hmm. D R U O N, Maurice Druon. And um, they republished them recently, and I think they're absolutely brilliant. A series on the 
uh, 100 Years War. That's that's only one, isn't it? I've got to think of some more. Um, (laughs) Right, well, I I better recommend at this point several of my friends who went... (laughs) (laughs) So, obviously, Charles Christian is is, is superb. Right. Um, Obviously, as is my mate Ben Kane. Mm-hmm. And Ben does write brilliant books, actually. Um, I like Ben's stuff as well. Yes, I do. You like Ben's stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he'll be delighted. Um, <laughs> he's moved from Roman to... Oh, so you're his reader. Yes, I am the one reader. <laughs> and I wasn't the one that gave him the one star. I gave him a three star because, you know, it wasn't as good as yours, obviously. Well, <laughs> that's what I like to hear. Um, <laughs> Ben's moved recently from Roman set novels to Richard the Lionheart and the Crusades, mm. hasn't he? Which is yeah, very exciting. Has. In the same way, Giles moved from uh, Vikings um, to Arthurian. Mm. I'm desperate, desperately now trying to think of a third historical novelist I couldn't admire more. Oh, that's um, Simon Scarrow, Frank says. Uh huh. Um, oh. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move on from that then. Um, no, I know, I know, I don't know Simon. We... George MacDonald Fraser. Yes, George MacDonald Fraser, Flashman yeah, novels. Yeah. Brilliant. Let's have that because no, they are. The, I really do think they're the gold standard of historical novels, combining mm-hmm. the scholarship with the storytelling, the humor, and the depth of characterization. Brilliant. Yeah, superb. Don't forget about that author that's got a paperback book coming out Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Did I mention Thursday? <laughs> You might have done. You might have done. Well, actually, this is a good one for Steve because he said, Harry, which of your oh, books should dear. I start with? So apart from oh. the Thursday release, oh. <laughs> if you were going to read one of your books, which uh, to start with, obviously, because he'd buy all the other 12 as we have established now. Um, I would I, what, um, I choose one of two. Either my very first novel, which is called Fire in the East, which introduces Ballista and starts the Warrior of Rome series, or... One called The Last Hour, which um, is, again, a ballista novel, but it's it's actually number seven in the series, but it's a standalone um, thriller. So far in the East or The Last Hour, I very much hope you enjoy them. And you can contact me on Facebook, too. I'm, I'm on it all the time, aren't I, Dom? You are indeed. Relentless. Yeah, relentlessly, relentlessly hounded me oh. to get on this stream. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> 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 Wanted to plug his Thursday book, apparently. Yeah. Is it out on Thursday? Yeah, yeah Thursday. Funny, apparently, funny it apparently it's Thursday, yeah. <laughs> Oh, dear God. Um, right, I think we are coming towards the end here. So don't forget to go on to Mezzas Minis and put in that code for your 10% off. Uh, so, gentlemen, what have we got planned this week? Anything? Well, I know Ken's coming around here on, on Wednesday, so I'm going to have to find something to put him, somewhere to put him that's safe. I hope you've you got a beer. because I'm. Yeah. <laughs> I have got. I, I've still, you know what? Last time you came over was just before we went back into lockdown the last time, and I bought yeah. some low-alcohol beer, especially you for go. you. There you go. I'll and it's sat those. in the cooler since then, so it should be nice and cool by now. So um, I know we're going to have a game together. What about you, Martin? You got anything planned this week? Uh, game-wise, so I'll be having a, a game with my, my regular opponent on Wednesday. I don't know what we're playing yet, but we're doing one. That's like the the, the one that I don't, I don't ever film because it's just something that I can go and do. Uh, I have finished a whole load of Japanese terrain. I've got a command base to do, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to the pub for the first time in a, in a very long time, so there probably won't be a lot of content happening. Um, <laughs> no, uh, um, no, I'm painting a lot of Japanese scenery at the minute. There you go. Japanese, Japanese scenery. scenery. <laughs> I, hate to, I hate to ask Steve what he's up to this weekend because he told us his girlfriend's coming up for the first time in... Yes. A few months. Um, <laughs> so, uh, is there anything no, I'll, 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 you I'll, want to say about what you're going to be up to this weekend? I'll keep, I'll keep it family friendly. Mm. Uh, no, I'm um, now that we can all meet up, I'm going to try and um, badger my. <laughs> 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 I literally said that without thinking about it. It just it's, it's part of my my, my regular it's vocabulary now. Vocabulary, yes, yeah. Wow. Badger. Ooh. Um, <laughs> no, I'm going to try and arrange a game of bolt action in the, the very near future with my regular gaming opponent um, mm-hmm. because I haven't played bolt action in well quite a while since february last year yeah. so uh but painting wise um lanch next i think they're going to be for the foreseeable um because I, I looked in that, that starter box i'm looking at the other day and i went mildly faint 
um, <laughs> at, at how much is actually in there and how much I've got to get through. I did. I did. I, I, I worked it out. If I painted eighteen land snacks a week, it would take me so many months. Um, but the chances of me painting eighteen land snacks a week is not happening. Um, it really isn't. You can't uh, weasel out of it, mate. Stip is shining this weekend. Uh, Ken, uh, put me off for one. <laughs> oh, let me let, let me let me just answer Owen. Owen just put up water. Yes, that 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 will happen. The Wars of Roses back rep will happen. No, he's not going to do them any. No, he's not going to do them anymore. Unsubscribe. <laughs> they're not going to go to you. <laughs> You're <laughs> not doing the Wars of the Roses. You've never so. done a War of the Roses battle in your life, Ken. So oh, let's let's leave the final words to Harry. Uh, how about you, Harry? Have you got what have you got planned? Anything? Any gaming or any kind of uh, writing this week? Um, yep, yeah, got to write chapters six and seven of my Alexander novel. In terms of gaming, because I like to tie things together, I'm going to download and try and learn how to play a roll and write war game called The Path of Alexander which is published by Yank for American firm called CSL, I think. Um, that I've never heard of before, but yeah, it looks quite pro it looks quite different and innovative. So, but of course, it'll probably take me a lot more than a week to learn the, even the simplest eight-page set of rules, won't it? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Uh, yeah, you need somebody who knows what they're doing to tell you how to do it. That's the best thing. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> anyway, that is the end of the stream on this Monday night. And Owen says, if you played 100 Year War, Ken, it, we'd see. Yeah, there you go. So get on to 100 Year War, and then maybe people come across to your channel. Thank you so much, Harry, for joining us tonight. Really, you've been a pleasure to have on. It's been great value. So thank you so much indeed. If you want to make another plug about what's coming out on Thursday. I think there's a paperback called um, The Return coming out on Thursday. Thursday. There you go. Go to Amazon or all good booksellers and, and pick it up for yourselves. And, and Thanks happy very birthday, much. Dom. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, thanks very much indeed. Who's uh, who's on next week? I can't remember who's it's leaving me. next week. It's oh, me. it's Steve again. The, the magic potato works again next week for Steve. Yes. So yes. join On Point HQ and... Um, we will see what we'll see you all there. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much for yeah, spending your Monday night with you. We'll see you again soon. See you. Bye. 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 B